Hello and happy Pride to all. Welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 135, Roll and Move. Is it really that terrible? Our top Roll and Move games. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight we've got a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons who doesn't quite understand all the hatred of the roll and move mechanic in board games. Once we get through that main topic, I do have a couple of Aventuria Adventure Card Game expansions I'm going to review, including the Master Taylor's Poltergeist and Arsenal of Heroes. Finally, in our week in review, I've got some more Aventuria, a digital play of the crew, well, actually multiple digital plays of the crew, and first thoughts on Battle of Gog, which is a game that launches on Kickstarter next week. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Today, let's start with a toot toot about our Rail Pass review. First up, Theodore Bent simply comments, thanks for the unboxing and review. Then Tom Green, the designer of the game, wrote to say, Rail Pass designer here, thanks so much for trying the game and taking the time to do such a thorough and fair review, in my opinion. I've, uh, I've played my game hundreds of times, and I still like it best as a two-player game. I've experimented with playing solitaire. I think the key is pick a time to set on the clock and then simply adjust up or down with subsequent plays, depending on your skill level. Try to beat your best score and then give yourself less time to increase the challenge when you're ready. The time limit should give a sense of urgency and tension, but not overwhelm the players. Keep in mind, the expectation is that no player actually runs out of cubes at their city to deliver, as in the real world, there would be an endless supply. Getting about half the cubes sent out and 10 cubes of each color delivered to all six cities would be a win. 10 by 10 equals 100, assuming no penalties. Well, thanks for the kind words, Theodore and Tom. Uh, as usual, I have to point out how awesome it is and how much I love it when we get the actual game designers or the publishers interacting with our com content. It shows that they care, and that's great. So thanks, Tom, for not only commenting, uh, but he actually took the time to comment on, like, all versions of our Rail Pass content. He obviously, like, found the one thing and then Googled it or did whatever, followed followed the breadcrumbs, because, like, he had commented on YouTube, he commented on Twitter, he found my post on Board Game Geek and everything. So thanks so much for that. That's really appreciated, actually, because it does help more people find our stuff. That is something we always appreciate. Always take time to like, thumbs up, and ding the bell, whatever you need to do to show that you've actually acknowledged that you saw our content and enjoy it. Now, I do find it fascinating that the designer themselves thinks Rail Pass is best at two. Now, when you hear about this game, whether you're passing things back and forth and there's six cities and you can play six players, I just picture a big party game where the more the players, the better the game's going to be and the more interesting it's going to be. And that's actually, in a way, not the case. Like Deanna and I, especially Deanna, really preferred the game at the lower player counts. Though I do still really want to try it with six. I want to see what that experience is like. Now, I do love the idea Tom has for playing solo. And I like the point from him that the timer is meant to add urgency and tension, but not be overwhelming. Which makes me think I should try it again uh, with Gigi to see if, uh, like, we're not I can, you can't remove the timer, but definitely give more time on the clock. And then looking at his point about score, the last two games we played, we actually did have empty cities. So we obviously gave ourselves too much time. So now I know next time I play, if it's just Deanna and I, or three of us actually with uh, with Grace as well, we probably need to cut a minute or two off that. Okay. Well, speaking of designers interacting with our stuff, mm -hmm. let's move on to our review of A Little Wordy, a two-player game from Exploding Kittens. First up, John Michael Garapi writes, your review pretty much covered all the bases. This is a surprising change of pace for the oatmeal. Yep. I hope he sticks with it. Well, the oatmeal, Matthew Inman himself, commented on our review to say, thanks so much for the kind, thoughtful, and thorough review. The game was an experiment for us, both making it two-player only, as well as a strategic word game. Well, thanks so much for the comments, Matthew and John. Uh, I personally think the experiment was a success. 
So I really look forward to seeing more games from you and Exploding Kittens, more strategy games, right? Like a little heavier, meatier stuff. I really hope it does well. Like as far as I can tell, the gaming people I've seen that have played it have really enjoyed it. I just hope the general populace, the the average, you know, Walmart shopper is picks it up and also enjoys it and isn't looking for games where you throw burritos at each other. All right. Well, now let's move on to our review of Magical Kitties Save the Day, a family-friendly RPG about playing magical cats. Now, David Fox shared our first review with the text Great Review by Motus Gion. After you've read the review, you should purchase the game. He then went on to comment on the review itself to say, I think what I love about this is that you can make any magical animal you want. If you have a player who wants to make a magical puppers, you can. That is just how flexible this system is. I am even thinking, because I like to do this with every system I play, at least to see if it can handle it, of doing a Disney Pixar reskin. Also... My solution for remembering bonuses for three success or more, I use acrylic blue gems I got from the dollar store in the craft aisle. Here's a listing on Amazon if folks can't wait or can't find them, but as restrictions ease on what is essential, go out and grab some. They work well, they fit the theme and look of the dice. So these were the the, the blue clear crystals. They, it's, every board game uses these now. So first off, thanks, David, for sharing our content. Uh, as I just said, I, we love content and we love hearts and thumbs. Those are all great. But even better is if someone shares our content with the world. So that is awesome. Thank you very much for that. Now, I do like David's suggestion of using those craft gems to track bonuses. Uh, personally, after running that first game and having all three of my players kind of complain that they couldn't remember their bonuses, I actually started looking for stuff on Etsy. And the main thing I kept finding are this, these plus one tokens that were kind of generic. And I was thinking it might be worth picking up because I know Powered by the Apocalypse games have the plus one four and those other games that tend to give you carryover bonuses. So they might be useful for more than one game. But I also went down a rabbit hole trying to find 3D printed or acrylic cat paws because I thought cat paws in this particular case would be extremely appropriate and you'd hand them out to the players if they have the bonus or the helping paw of another character. Now, the thing I hadn't really been thinking of when I was doing this, though I saw them, is the price where David's suggestion is at a dollar store, which, yeah, that makes a little bit more sense in, in most cases. Definitely a cheaper option. Uh, the conversation actually continued, and he actually sent me a link on Etsy to uh, little plastic Band-Aids, which I thought was really cool for tracking owies. Mm -hmm. And then we started going back and forth, and I'm like, you know what would also work? It's just real Band-Aids. Like, I know I have kids, so I have, like, a big box of 10,000 bandages and all kinds of sizes. Just go in and pull out the smallest ones and get, like, a bunch of those. Those would work cool for owies, I think. And then maybe bigger ones for injuries. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I, it's bad in a way that I'm looking for ways to improve this game, but there's it definitely could use a couple of component impress, in, in, improvements. That's the word I'm looking <laughs> for. All right. Well, finally, one more ego boost with this comment from Ashley Cunningham, who wrote, Hello. Just started listening to your podcast, and it is really great. Thank you so much for making games so fun. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome for uh, for the thank you, I guess. That came up weird. Uh, but thanks for the comment, Ashley. Um, for what I understand here, Ashley actually discovered the show thanks to longtime fan Brian Kurtz. So thank you, Brian, for sharing the love. And welcome, Ashley. I'm glad you've been digging the show. I'm glad we've been able to make the hobby fun. So before I want to move on, I want to point out one note from the chat. Someone just suggested something great that I know you can get cheap for Magical Kitties is cat-shaped erasers, paw-shaped or cat heads. Don't, I, I, now I need, um, what's the, the educational toy store that's here in Windsor every Scholar's Choice. Scholar's Choice. I need Scholar's Choice to open up because they always have like big bins of cheap erasers. I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. Yep. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we move on to our main topic. Our Ticket to Ride digital giveaway is done and over with. And our winner is... Mikhail Rappaport from the U.S. Congratulations, Mikhail. Now that this giveaway is done and over, we're already working on our next one. I think this time we may actually give away a physical game, though I do regret that it was going to be limited to entries in the U.S. and Canada only. 
though there is a chance we did have a patron step up and offer to pay for shipping. So I need to confirm that. And there is a chance we may be able to open up this wide open. And I wasn't going to do it originally because I had to confirm it, but I did talk to Deanna about this. I think we're going to give away a copy of one of the games we discovered this year that we absolutely love. And that is Space Base, a new sealed copy of Space Base from AEG. That'll go live either next week or the week after, depending on if we have time to get it all set up and ready to go. So we're looking forward to putting that on the table. Keep on listening and expect news of that giveaway to hit in a future episode. Might as well keep going. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from local game designer and tabletop bellhop patron, Roger Malosh, who writes, Hey, Mo and Sean, I'm really enjoying your show. Thank you for the occasional mention of my not ready for primetime games. I have a question for you. What's so bad about roll and move? Backgammon is a roll and move. If it's played at a fast pace for stakes, two bits a point, and the doubling cube is used, it can be very intense and exciting game. Just because this mechanism was ex employed very poorly in the past doesn't mean it's bad. I believe it's getting a bad rap because of the lack of player decisions and lack of ways to mitigate poor dice rolls in games like Monopoly or Snakes and Ladders. Mm. I'm currently working on a roll and move game with many tactical and strategic decisions. Are there any other roll and move games you know of which use this mechanism effectively? Well, thanks so much for the question, Roger, as always, and for supporting the show. Um, you are right. Uh, the roll and move mechanic has a bad rap in the hobby board game world and even in the non-hobby board game world. And I think you nailed some of the most important reasons, actually, in your question there. But what I do want to do is start an open discussion between Sean and I in the chat room if you care to take part um, about... The the, one of the oldest board game mechanics out there, potentially the oldest board game mechanic out there, though that seems to be debated. And I'm sure some of the things Roger mentioned, we're going to get to as well, because he, he, like I said, he almost answered his own question there, except for the part about what the best are. But I want to get into game recommendations first. First, I think we need to do, uh, define what a rolling move is. And I got to admit, I was almost tempted to leave this as the entire topic this week, just like we did for the definition of train games, because I'm not sure how long this will go but I decided to combine it with a recommendation list too. So traditionally, personally, if I think off the top of my head without doing any research, first thing I thought of was any game where I roll the dice and then move one piece, my piece, my one thing, that many spots based on the roll. Sometimes it's two dice, but there are obviously other games that do that. Like in my head, roll moves, that's what it is, right? I think of games, I think of uh, Snakes and Ladders. Sorry, as shoots and ladders for those of you in the U.S. who you're, you can't allow snakes. Snakes are evil. Um, snakes and ladders and sorry and trouble. Well, sorry, you actually get more than one piece. So I, so that's part of it, right? What what about a game where you have multiple pieces and when you roll the dice, you pick which piece to move. When we get that, there's your back game, right? Does that count as a roll and move? Or now that I'm not moving one piece, is it not? Or does this apply to games where you choose what to do first, then roll, right? So you're gonna you're gonna go, I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna roll. And then how about games where you roll lots of dice? And I'm like, I got six dice, and I assign them, whether that's different ways. So, what 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 is a roll? Are those all rolling moves? They they all like is that our definition? So for me personally, I feel like I'm probably on the stricter end of what is a rolling move. For me, you generate randomness. And I'm, and I'm going to side with Board Game Geek on this one, where roll, spin, I don't care what you do. Generate a random number, okay. and then move something as a result based on that random outcome. So, right, so if you roll if you roll 2d6, and then you get to choose which piece of story you move, that's a roll and move. If you okay. only have one piece you can move, you know, you roll a d6, and it says 6, you move that only piece you have, 6 moves around the Monopoly board, that's a roll and move. Uh, but I'm a little less good about the whole, you know, rolling like Sagradas and, and the, the, you know, rolling and, and, and placing dice and doing things. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So roll in place, I think is definitely something different. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I, I, I think the thing is the things on the board that move have to be there. They have to already be there. Yep. You're affecting the current boards. No, affecting the current board state doesn't work. No, because no, that that fits both. <laughs> but like you're moving stuff that's already there, right? You 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 start your pieces in Monopoly on Go. 
you start your 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 necromancer in talisman in the um the, the graveyard you and then you affect that that piece so think, what so about official what about official definition were you able to find many official definitions so well wikipedia has uh, board games in which a player's token or tokens are moved based on results shown on die or dice so that would be any thing where you're going to move something based on roll or die that that seems a little too broad it's it's like it's, in, in in that case i think you could probably fit in because uh, sagrada right you're going to roll the dice and you are going to move them as based on the results on the dice possibly although the, you're not moving a separate token so you're moving that's the true. dice, not die a separate you token. So you, yeah, yeah. That, okay. It does it does require tokens. That that's actually, I mean, it's not too far off from my definition, but that doesn't mean it's a good definition because honestly, roll and move is really generic and encompasses yeah. a ton of games. Uh, now next up we have Board Game Geek, uh, which is the roll spin and move games, and this is where I I side with them. Mm -hmm. Roll, spin, and move games are games where players roll dice or spin spinners and move playing pieces in accordance with the roll. So that's almost the same thing, but they're a little, just slightly different. I, I, I guess that, to me, the Wikipedia is implying you have to roll first, where the BGG seems more open. Right. That the dice could be rolled either way. So, um, so I like, I'm thinking... Anything you roll first is going to be the, the Wikipedia definition, but also fit the BGG one. Yep. So I, they both kind of work. So the usual type, right? So you're rolling the dice and you move. You've got all your, your monopolies, your clue, Cluedo, snakes and ladders, etc. They've been used for years, like, like sorry, trouble, and then even going further back to older games. I'm drawing a blank on some of them right now off the top of my head is um <laughs> sorry and, uh, i think those are definitely roll moves like I, I don't i think that definitely fits the the definition the, the the common definition the commonly accepted definition but what about ones where you w decide what you're going to do so you plan ahead you're like i am going to do this and then i'm going to roll the dice to see if it works does that count as a rolling move? So the, the biggest example of this is, is modern is Rallyman GT, but there are other games that have this aspect. So I'm very firmly against Rallyman GT being a rolling move. I, I think it, it, it uses rolling and it uses moving, but under the definitions that I'm happy with of roll and move, it's really not because you're playing, I, and, and to be honest, I think this probably actually goes along with can't stop which other people have talked about mm -hmm. um it's very much That's the same one. thing you're rolling and you are allowed to do something because of the role the role is not telling you what to do like when i roll a dice in rally man gt that it's it's a yes no i've just it's it's not influencing my move other than saying yes or no whereas if i rolled the you know if i rolled a number of gear dice and those dice said you get gears one two three four I could then move mm -hmm. one, two, three, four. That would be different. Whereas in this case, it's just a yes, no binary decision. But even then, if we look at the BGG definition, you are going to roll dice and move playing pieces according to that roll. You're well, going to... see Because you're rolling and you're either moving forward or you're not. And to me, you're moving according to that role. Yes, it's yes, no, but it's still yes, no. It's am I moving forward or not? And the dice tell me if that's well, true again, or not. But again, though, with... with if we go back to Rally, Rally Man GT, you can rearrange your dice if you failed, if you do an all-in-one roll, for instance. So if I roll all my dice at once and I get three fails... But then you're moving according to those dice you are assigning. Them. But I'm rearranging how I assign them. So it's not the roll as much as my decision that's influencing the move. All right, so jumping over to con Can't Stop, I think Can't Stop is a roll move. You literally roll the dice and you move the pieces, the numbers on the dice. Well, you 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 choose a piece. One, you only get to move once. So if you roll a six, you move the piece that's on six. One, you don't move anything. Six pieces, as six spaces. But you're still moving a piece based on the accordance of the roll. The roll determines what piece you can move instead of how far it goes. Right. But it still determines what piece you can move. I saw, that's where that's where yeah, it gets. Yeah. It, it gets right? it gets blurry. Like I don't think that fits the Wikipedia definition. The, the definition because to me the wikipedia is saying you're moving it as far as the number on the die 
So well, I don't know why it's based on results. It doesn't. It, it well, says, it says based results on results shown on the diet. That's right. the, versus well, and, and, according to the role. Right. I guess they're kind of the same thing. I mean, based, if you're if you are moving a piece based on the results shown on a die, if I roll a six on can't stop, I move the piece on six on one, six. and that yeah, does that fit fits. the definition. I think that does fit. Rally man, I'm still I'm kind yeah, of on I'm the not, fence. I'm. 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 I'm, I'm uh, it's close. I'm not. I'm not there yet. I'm not. No one has convinced <laughs> me yet that. Uh, and maybe, the, maybe the chat room will be back one of us up and we can see if we can get some more arguments towards that. So uh, Red Meeple Ryan saying, if backgammon is a roll and move, then can't stop is. But again, it is different because you are moving the pieces in backgammon a number of diagonal, but well, I don't know what they're called. This shows I played backgammon for a long time. That's the number. It's not telling you what column you get to move things once. So that's the difference in can't stop. And what's interesting is can't stop, like we did the show notes ahead of time. We've done some research. Didn't even come up. And then I saw it just before going live and I was like that. Let's take a look. So, and and actually, um, Razul five hundred two in the chat room puts up an interesting point. Uh, the definition is often uh, up to the number rolled. So, in many games, if you roll a six, mm. you can move less than six, especially at the end of the game. Uh, you now, is that move. a roll and move though, or is a roll and move, especially the ones people hate, you have to move the number on the dice. Right. Once you add that up to, you now have all those decision points. Does that fall? I didn't even think of that type of game. I mean, to so, me, so let's look at let's look at a couple specific games. So Zaya, yep. it's got both because you can have the decision. Like normally, no, in Zaya, you have your one engine, you're going to roll your one die and see how far you can move. But once you put a second ship engine on that ship, you are making the decision before you roll and you have to make that decision. You have to be like, I am going to activate this engine or this engine. Mm -hmm. And if I activate this engine, it's going to give me this die. And if I activate this engine, it's going to give me that. So you have that decision before you roll. Which is which is a form of uh, the two different types of input input and output randomness. It actually changes it from output randomness of the or from input randomness of the dice tell me what I can do to I'm choosing what to do and the dice tell me if I could do it. Right. So, but I like I can't think of Zaya as not a roll and move, but it still has that I'm planning ahead, then rolling a die to see if it works. Right. Which again is kind of rally man. It's just the difference is I'm rolling to D6, so I have six results. Whereas in rally man, I have one of two results, go or no go. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. I, uh, and honestly, I haven't played Zaya enough to to be as basically. It's put a cube on your engine, roll the die for your engine. That's far how far you can move. Right. But then this gets to a whole other point. You can move anywhere. Right. You're on a hex map versus does roll and move imply you have to be on a track? Because so, Monopoly I, I, really is a track. Yeah. It just happens to go I, in a I circle. Would say, I would say the roll and move definition should not uh, define how you are moving, okay. only that you are moving. Um, so, and, and really, realistically for Zaya, to me, it's, it's a roll and move. There is just a decision before yes. the roll and move. So that, that separates the, the, okay. the decision. Whereas with Rallyman GT, it's that you're you're mixing that decision yeah, in you mix with the, the roll and move, and that's where the confusion and my concern about whether it is or isn't a roll and move comes in. So Zaya is still you roll and move. You yeah. have just you have just had to make a decision in you advance. It. It's much like in trouble. You know, I want to move my blue piece six spaces instead of this. You know, my second blue piece six yes. spaces or something. There there can be decisions. But okay. you are rolling according yep. to the outcome of the randoms, yeah, you know, randomization. Right. I, actually, Ryan worded it well. I don't think a roll and move stops being a roll and move once you have agency. Right. Yep. Still no, a roll. Yep. Absolutely. The agency right. is, is 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 we're going to get into. Us yeah, that. we're going to get into a little <laughs> bit more in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So so getting to other games. So what about dice placement games? The problem is I don't think you've played any of these to really get the idea. So yeah. Alien Frontiers, I take five d six, I roll them. On the board are spots where it's like place a straight, place two of a kind, place um, a pair, and you place your dice, and where you place them, you get actions. Right, and that's not a, now, that's not a roll and move to me. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm thinking it's not. The only thing is there is one spot where if you place it, you then get to place or move a colony on the board. But do you move it according to the number on the dice? Or is it no, just it's for using that spot. Yeah, so, so no, that's fair. That, that's, that's more of a, you know, you, if you put if you put a blue th token there, you get to move yep. something somewhere, the same thing. Okay, next is Kingsburg, probably the same thing as Alien Frontiers. You roll 3d6 and you have a board with the numbers 1 through 18. You then can place your dice. If you roll an 18, you can place it all three dice on 18, or you can place it on 6, 
I guess they'd all be sixes, six, six, and six three times, or you could place it on six, 12, and six, or whatever, right? Like, you can place whatever, and then you get resources and stuff for it. So, like, Valeria, like, uh, uh, it's not, similar. it's much different. It's, it's more like, yeah, yeah. think of a bingo board, and you're placing your dice on a bingo board to get stuff. But again, you're not moving yeah, you're anything not getting as, you're not moving anything as a yep. result of those rules. I agree. So, here's the complicated one Coimbra. You get dice in different colors, you roll them, you then, that's the cost you have to pay to buy something, right? That I get, that that fills with Alien Frontiers and Kingsburg, but at the same time, every time you use a die, you go up a track in that color, which then adjusts your income, but you are moving a piece up a track based on the value on the die. Right. So if what, what's brilliant about that game is like a purple die will let me buy a purple person. If I play a one, I get to buy them for only one gold. But then my purple luxury track only goes up one. Whereas if I pay a six, I got to pay six for the guy. But then my luxury track goes up six. That sounds like a roll and move to me. Or at least a roll and move mechanic within the larger yeah. game. See that that one? I think people are going to argue. No one's going to consider Coimbra a roll and move. I don't even think it was on the board game geek list, which but was see, very that's the, that's the open. Thing. And this is where we get into the same problem we had with racing games or whatever game you want to think. It there is a mechanic of roll and move inside of Coimbra. Is Coimbra right. a roll and move? No, but it at one point in the game uses the mechanic of roll and move, which doesn't right. break the game because again, no, we're going to get into all. the we're going to get into the whole good and bad. But so so yeah, I think this is something again we're going to hit on later. Is how much does it impact the game? I think it's going to be an important aspect. I, I Coimbra and, and then there's others right like Coimbra is the biggest one I can think of the most blatant example but there are all kinds of games where you roll dice and go up tracks based on the number you rolled yeah but they're not usually move a piece though it's move a counter it's keep track of resource like, like even a game where you roll 2d6 or even Valeria if you took Valeria and instead of collecting counters you made that a track for power and you moved your thing up the track when you got it does that turn Valeria into a rolling move and I'm kind of thinking not because it could be done another way. So maybe right. that's another whole aspect of it where Coimbra wouldn't count because yes, that's how the game tracks it, but you could hand out cards. Well, you again, could you could collect again, physical you get resources. Into the Just because you use a mechanic doesn't mean it is a roll and move game. Just because there's a train in the game doesn't make it a train <laughs> game. Again, you can use a roll and move mechanic without making a roll and move game. We don't have to call Coimbra a roll and move game. Yeah. It just happens to have that one mechanic in one tiny little aspect of the game. But again, is it even that mechanic? Because it's just one way to represent things means you move something, but well, they yeah, could but collect they chose, stuff instead. They chose to make it a roll and move. They could have chosen yeah. to make something else, but they choose to they chose to do it by right. rolling and moving. <laughs> so Razuel yeah. saying the same thing, space base. You track your resources on a board, they're moving along a track up and down, back and forth. Yep. I think that's pushing it. Like, yeah, I guess that's a roll and move. You're moving something. Based again, on the two definitions we have, it fits. Again, the two official. Again, it's a mechanic, not a game type, See, right? I don't know. I, I actually think it doesn't count if you could represent it another way. There is no other way to represent what space you are in Monopoly in relation to everyone else or what spot you are on in Shoots and Ladders. I can't collect tokens to show my progress in Snakes and Ladders. Well, sure you could. You don't need a board. You do it all with cards. You can make a Monopoly board, a game where you're just dealing out cards okay you you rolled a six here you you know the sixth card off the top of the deck or something there's ways to uh, do it yeah but you need to know where the other players are and like hey can i count your cards uh, well, it's, it's, I guess. You, know, it's just, you use a deck of cards instead of a, a, a track so it's still the same you're, you're still in the same order in the same place it's just yeah. a deck of cards instead of a board i don't think representation really makes that much of a difference i guess i'm having a hard time thinking of, of some of those games as rolling moves all right we're going we're gonna to step away for a second and look at some other stuff and see if this changes our thoughts at all. So let's start with why do people hate them? Why why do so many gamers absolutely supposedly despise roll and move, though I bet you a bunch of those love Coimbra, um, <laughs> hate this mechanic and think it's terrible? Be and obviously we kind of hinted at this earlier. Roger mentioned it right in his question. It's all about player agency and having meaningful choices. If there's no actual option presented, and then the game's purely random. It it's, it's, doesn't matter. It's meaningless. It leads to, uh, I, like, just the person who rolls better wins the game, right? Like, there's, there's no, no strategy. There's no tactics. 
There's no 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 way to plan ahead. The now, thing, the thing that the, the ruins um, board games for most hobby gamers is pure luck, or or the closer to pure luck you get, the farther from a true hobby game you get. Right? You want well, to be able to that's make equating hobby games with Euro games, though. You want to be able to make decisions that have mm. an impact, and if it's pure luck, there is no decision. There, there's no decision involved. Whether you're whether you know whether it's uh, how you shuffled the deck in uh, uh, um, the game you hate, uh, playing by Candyland. Candyland, or the rules you make on you know uh, on on um, snakes and ladders. It's it's all about how how much decision and uh, you have and yeah. how much it matters versus the pure luck. I just worry that you get pushed too much. Like uh, some luck can be good, but the, again, we get into the input output randomness thing. Well, there's, the that's, luck that's is other... okay if you make the decision and then there's the luck. If the luck determines what you can do, that's when it's a problem. Right. So Zaya, you can have lots of luck. You're going to roll the dice. You may not be able to get where you want, but you could probably go somewhere else or do something else. Or you have backups or you have ways to mitigate the randomness and all that. Where it's really bad is when you have no choice. Like it, it's it's not a check. It's not, oh, I want to do this. Let's see if it works. It's, all right, what do I got? All right, my option's that. I have to do it. I, I have no agency. I do the thing. That's when it's terrible. And that's why people hate rolling modes. And similarly, it can actually ruin otherwise good games. Like to me, the perfect example of this is Talisman. Technically, the original first and second editions of Talisman and third edition of Talisman. Like, I don't mind rolling to move on the outer ring, right? You get choices. Do I go left? Do I go right? Sometimes it kind of sucks. You don't get a good choice. But that, to me, it's part of the fantasy adventure. It's the random wandering. That's all fine. I have no problem with that. But it's there are multiple spots on that game board where you need a specific roll to progress, starting with the Sentinel on the, the outer panel, going to the um, the portal of power on the, in the second tier, where you have to land on it. And I have had so many games of Talisman where I could be in the lead and have plus 12 strength, plus 12 craft, ready to take on the game, and just I can't roll that number. I, I spend turns going past it, 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 until someone else comes up, excuse me, happens to get lucky, rolls and gets on the portal power and wins the game because of that. It drives me nuts. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you look at games like Clue, Cluedo, uh, where, you know, you can be the most brilliant person in the world and have the 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 perfect concept of logic puzzles, but if you don't get the information you need, you can't win. <laughs> you know. See that I've never understood why Clue even has Wool and Move. Yeah. Like like just let people teleport to whatever room they want to to ask the right question. Like I, I've never understood why that was put in there, except for tradition, right? Like because yeah. to a lot of people, here's another aspect is a lot of people who don't know better think every board game is either a card game or a game where you roll dice right? in some way. And there are a lot of people that grew up thinking that. Absolutely. I mean, a, a board game is, and, and you know, a I, board I, with I grew pieces, up, you roll it's dice. a board, you roll dice to move somewhere. And there's a lot yes. of different things you can do within that, as mm -hmm. we're showing today even. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you are rolling or spinning in the case of the game of life. And, you know, again, generating a random mm -hmm. value and using that value to move around a board that is the game. So a great example of this that kind of blew my mind because like I've been a hobby gamer so long, I don't, I don't think about the fact that not everyone thinks the way of, of games the same way. We are at the Windsor Comic Con. I'm there with uh, Jeff Sue's friend and patron of the show. And we are with the CG Realm and we're promoting our Extra Life event coming up. As part of that, we're giving away a copy of Harry Potter Funkoverse. Now, this is before it was available to the public. So this was a big deal. And we had demo games set up. And the first couple that came to play in cosplay, we actually taught Gambit and um, Phoenix how to, how to play Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. The first thing they did was grab the dice and roll them. And then went, now what do I do? And I'm like, why are you rolling the dice? Like, well, what, how do you start your turn? I'm like, well, you have four action points. You can do these things. <laughs> well, what are the dice for? Well, if you attack someone, you're going to roll them and see what happens. So I don't roll to see how far I can move. I'm like, no, no, you got four points. Do whatever you want. You can move, you can attack. You can, and it, like, you could just see the, they were younger. I'm going to say kids, but they're not necessarily kids. I'm like, I remember their, their heads just like, oh, wow. Like, like games can do this. 
And I got to say, I don't think of Funko verse. I think of that more as a mainstream game than anything else. But yeah, it doesn't have a role in Moonfest, but it blew people's minds. Yep. No, it's 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 a <clears throat> it's a strange concept for someone who has lived with the concept the of Hasbro Family Game Night, because yeah. Hasbro Family Game Night is roll and move i mean that's you know you're either rolling and move or answering trivia questions <laughs> and to be honest it's actually probably i hadn't thought of this before but a reason why Catan was so readily accepted by people because you start every turn by rolling 2d6 right you didn't move pieces but you got resource but you still you started your turn the other player passed you the dice and you threw them on the ground yep. on the ground on the table <laughs> If you're, if you're playing on the ground, you're, you're you're really doing that real world Catan thing. I got... But but I think we agree. The, the the bad thing about roll and move is a lack of agency. Like that Absolutely. that is the ultimate problem. That is the problem with roll and move. Yeah. So, what makes a good roll and move? Obviously, meaningful choices. Like that that it's the opposite of the the problem with them is give me an actual meaningful choice. Right. If you're gonna roll the dice, if you're if you're gonna roll the dice and say okay, you're gonna roll that dice and you have to move however many spots it comes up. Well, that's fine if I can move in any direction I yes. want, if I that's can maybe use some of that, uh, some of those points, movement points to say open a door or not open yep. a door or, you know, make me, allow me to do something with the ability uh, uh, that I've rolled. So that, that makes me jumping back to our talks on different types of games. So would you consider a game where you roll to randomly generate a number of action points that can then be used to take different actions, a roller move? Yeah. Like, like if XCOM, <laughs> you got a random number of points. Yeah. It's, I know I'm thinking of a video yeah. game. But yeah. The yeah. FASA Star Trek, the role-playing game, is the first game I can think of with action points. Pandemic, if you roll the D6 and instead of getting four actions, you got one through six actions every turn. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's roller move sounds good so the other one that i think needs to be added in here too is the move multiple pieces so you make your roll and it's not just move one thing it's you can pick so yeah, the story is probably the best example of this i think trouble has the same thing aren't the two games are pretty similar uh, parcheesi i mean parcheesi uh, yeah. via topo which we Supu, have behind us uh, or Supu, Supo or whatever that game the 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 chinese game from yeah we, we didn't actually get into that <laughs> 220 is literally parcheesi and sorry and but yeah. in you know ancient ancient times so sorry is cards sorry doesn't use cards does it not it's maybe. been so long since i played oh, I'm sorry. Thinking, you're in trouble we're in trouble i think is i'm thinking trouble not sorry I think okay so. sorry well, I, although i think it's still you can draw random cards see how far you move but yeah, having having that choice of I can move one of multiple pieces, I, even the up to, right? I can move up to six is a huge one. Yeah, Trouble has the pop -o -matic, I knew that, but I'm trying to think of the one where if you land on the opponent's piece, you slide, they go back to the beginning. I think that's in both, right? Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, is both Trouble and Sorry have that? Where yeah, you that land mechanic on is, yeah, that mechanic is both. Yeah. Uh, so meaningful choices. Another one that I think makes a roll and move better is some way to mitigate the randomness. So this is something that we talk a lot about, Zaya Legends of the Drift system, and how it's so much better with the expansion. Well, the expansion added modules you can add to your engines that give you minimum die roll results. So you no longer have that. I build the biggest engine in the game, and I'm going to roll a D20 to move and roll a 1. They totally remove that possibility. But you do have to buy a thing to do it, but it makes sense, right? You're, you're a new pilot. You got your new ship. You're not that good at flying yet. Then, you know, you put a new thing on, you get your autopilot, now you can fly a little better. But anything like that, there's um, Pulsar. There's a game that involves rolling dice. There is Pulsar a roll and move. Because one of the actions you can take in Pulsar is move your ship with your dice. Yeah. So, yeah, there, that's Again. one of Sean's favorite games. Yeah. So, yeah, so Pulsar, right? You have, you can buy those re-roll things. And you can buy the, the what is it, P minus one, plus one, or yeah. plus two, I think, are the two tokens you can get. And then there's things you can get on your base that give you bonuses and so on. So any, any way to mitigate the randomness is going to make a basic roll and move better. And, and that to be honest... And that includes what we were talking about earlier of saying you don't have to move all your points, right? Yes. If if in Talisman, you didn't have to move six every time mm -hmm. you rolled a six, yep. you would have mitigated the randomness and it wouldn't be as bad because you wouldn't be bouncing back and forth yes. or trying to get on that one spot you need and losing the game because of it. Yeah. And, and to be honest, a slight spoiler, uh, I do put Talisman on the list tonight because the fourth edition changed that. It's, right. it's, if you haven't played Talisman since the 80s and 90s, it may be worth trying again because of that. 
Um, the other thing here, though, is I think another thing that makes Roland moves uh, good is probably not the right word, but tolerable is that the Roland moves just a small part of the game, right? There's lots of other interesting, cool things going on. And here's where the, that aspect of Coimbra, while important to your final score and everything else, it's just a small part of the very it, point salad, right? It's, it's, it's one ingredient in the point salad, and it's really more of a track, and it's not as much a roll and move. So the game isn't ever about who rolls the highest. And again, that is back to that meaningful choices. But if you remove the, the, the runaway leader problem of the person who rolls sixes always wins, that makes the roll and move more tolerable. Yeah, absolutely. Any anytime you're, uh, you know, any anytime you're you're giving the person more options, giving yes. you know, again, it's again, it's less random. <laughs> the anytime you anytime you can make the dice hurt you less, um, you know, point 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 to where all the places where the dice hurt you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the other one is if you replace the randomness with push your luck elements. So I know we kind of said rally man's not. Uh, uh, a um, roll and move but one of the things that rally man does is i'm going to go with the definition that you are rolling yes or no you get to move so it counts for this and what it does is it remove replaces complete randomness with push your luck so you're going to roll that first die and if you make it you may as well keep rolling you may as well keep rolling and you're getting your move one spot every time for doing it but then eventually you roll a uh, I, I don't know what they're called hazard symbol yep and it's raining out so now you know if you roll one more hazard symbol your car is not only going to stop moving, it's going to wipe out. So now I have the option to stop or I can push my luck and roll. By throwing that in there, you change the entire emotional feel of the die roll, which I think makes that form of roll and move what's so engaging. Why rally man so much fun is that push your luck element, in my opinion. That's fair, except you make those decisions before you start rolling. So No, you don't have to roll flat out. You don't have to roll all your dice at once. You can roll them one at a time. Well, yeah, but you still have to. If you've lit, if you've put out six dice, you need to either roll them all, unless you have the the point the the safe safety points to spend. No, not even that. You can just roll one die and stop. Really? You don't have to roll all six dice. That's why I think it's a roller move. Sean plays rally man very different than I do. Apparently, obviously. apparently I do. <laughs> um, I don't know. I you just... can just roll. You can roll two dice and get two warnings and just stop and be like, "Oh, I only move two. and you're at whatever gear the last die you used was. Okay, I don't think I've ever played it that way because I there always you go. I, I don't I don't put down more dice than I know I could get away with. Oh, see, I put um, down all six dice every round, every single time I put down every die, and then I roll them one at a time, and then stop oh. when I'm like I I I am gonna push my luck or not. Interesting. Maybe that's why Sean thinks it's not a roll and move. I, maybe that's also why I'm beating you almost every game. I don't know. Yeah, that could be it too. <laughs> Eric, oh, Eric, uh, we'll talk about that in the, in yeah. the on the table. Uh, <laughs> Rally man's really good. Accessibility, you I you'd need someone to help. Yeah. It's possible. The the hardest part is going to be tracking where everyone is on the board. I'm not sure how you would represent that. I, physically, you should be able to feel it. Yeah. And and the dice literally have one warning symbol on each side, and the rest are the the real problem is up. um understanding your hazards in advance. Like you you need to be able to pl plan out yeah. your uh, path because of all the various hazards and gears you need to be in you'd have to do some funky stuff with the boards and the corners and what you need in each spot but i think it's possible yeah all right all well, right i think now that we've talked about what makes a game a roll and move <laughs> let's move on to some roll and move game suggestions all right just first let, let's summarize okay so you roll a die you move something that was on the board somewhere else is that pretty much it yeah, it still it still introduces some problems. For instance, how do you get the first piece on to can't stop? Oh, okay. So there's somebody said, or just can't stop, not a rolling race. Or just can't stop, not a I'm I'm I'm, I'm that, 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 the... that makes me kind of lean the other way. Yeah. I think the most commonly accepted is you already have stuff out. You roll dice and then move them based on what's rolled on the dice. Yeah. So I think we might have just not can't we stop. May have out not not that. can't stop out. Okay, there we go. We might have with that. It doesn't. It doesn't eliminate. It doesn't eliminate Rally Man. But uh, again, I'm apparently I'm playing it wrong. So yeah, <laughs> Rally Man. Well, again, Rally Man. It's because you roll after. It's it's the fact it swaps from again output randomness to input randomness, and or the other way around. I'm getting those all confused tonight. All right. So basically, I, I think everyone's got an idea. But yeah, it's a mess, right? Like, yep. it, and there's a reason it's a mess. But we do completely agree on the reason Roland move can suck completely is it can strip away all player agency 
And the games that do it right somehow add that back in or do something else to make the game fun. Because our first game is kind of an exception to what I just said. Yep. So moving on to them. I am going to start with Zaya, Legends of the Drift System. And you know what? This really is. It's terrible. Like, like the, the, the roll and move system in this is terrible. The expansion does mitigate it, so that makes it better. It's one of the reasons the expansion is good. But in Zaya, that game is just so random in general. Like you're moving through things and you're drawing random cards and random things are going to happen and ships are going to move random amounts and you're going to jump onto a new thing and you don't know what's there and you might jump into the sun. And when something attacks you, you got to roll and there's like a 50% chance you're going to, ship's going to ice over. Like that is the fun of that game. It is a so random, you have to embrace it. And that's when Zaya is fun. And in this case, Yes, I build the biggest engine, but I might roll a one. But I also, if I build the biggest engine and I roll a 20, I go so fast that I gain a fame point for flying the fastest ship in the galaxy. And to me, that's what Zaya is. Zaya is the sandboxy, you don't know what's going to happen, random die rolls. Like if it was an RPG, it'd be running everything from the back of the red box, rolling random dungeons. That's Zaya, but in board game format. And you know what? I love it because you have to embrace it. There are so many die rolls. It's not only roll and move. You're also rolling to, to go through everything. You also are rolling to get through shields, and you're you're rolling to see how much your weapons do. And like it's just it's a dice fest. And I gotta say, I, it's one of the best roll and moves out there. But you have to embrace it. You know what you're getting into if you play a game of Zaya. You know that the person who rolls the most twenties in the game might win the game just because they're lucky, and that's part of the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the things is I, with Zaya, there's almost uh, too much randomness, or not too much, but well, there's, there's so much randomness that it becomes fun again. Mm-hmm. Is the sort of thing. And there's so many because you're you're there's a random amount of different random things you can get into. You're, yes, you're getting into you know exponential randomness in there. Uh, and that was Zaya Legends of a Drift System. Next, I have Camel Up which a lot of people still like to call Camel Cup, even though they finally fixed the logo so it doesn't look like that. Why this one works is it's a race. And rolling dice to see how much things move in a race just makes sense. To me, that's logical. It's a logical use for the mechanism. Now, what makes Camel Up work is you don't own any of the camels. You're not rolling to move your camel. You are randomly getting a die to tell you which camel to move and rolling it to see how far it moves. And you have no control over that. It completely strips away player agency because that's not the part that you are doing as a player. What you're doing as a player is betting on those camels. And then there's the funky mechanic of camels stacking that makes it fun and interesting. The results of a race like this that you're betting on should be random. That's kind of the point of playing a gambling-based game is yes, you can play the odds. And what I like about Camel Up is the closer the camels get to the end, the more you can play the odds. Like, you know, there's only three dice left and there's a chance the green camel will move. But if the green camel moves, the orange one's going to end up on top. So the orange will win. Like, that's all part of the game. And none of those decisions have anything to do with the dice that come out until after the fact, right? After the camels are moved, now you're going to make a whole bunch more decisions. Then dice are going to happen. Stuff's going to change. And then you're going to make decisions again. And that's why I think Roll and Move works great in Camel Up. Absolutely. And, and part of it is that you're not controlling your own personal yes. fate with that dice roll, right? It's the big difference between Clue, where if you roll a dice, your little token is the only thing that's going to mm-hmm. happen and you're going to hate yourself or not. Or whereas if you roll a dice in Camel Up, everyone is being affected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it adjusts the board state for everyone, not just you. So there's a good aspect. And so that was Camel Up. Next, Formula D, which I think we can officially call it that because it's been out in North America long enough. I don't have to call it Formula Day anymore. Um, What I think works in this one, this one is a racing game. Yes, you own your own car, uh, with the really fun, actually, is when you own two cars because you get points for both. It's actually a better game, I find, with five or less players so you can each run two cars. But ignoring that, what works here is that the dice are not as random as they look. So if you haven't played Formula D, you're going to look at the game and think, well, if I go slow, I roll the D4. And if I go fast, I roll the D6. If I go really fast, I roll the D20. And there's even a D30. But the thing in that game is that most people don't realize until you play it is the dice don't show all the numbers. So the D4 is actually you move one or two only. But the D30 
as you move, I think the range is 15 to 8 or no, oh, it's 15 to 18 or something like that with a weight towards 8 or 15 to 30 with the weighted towards the 18. And that changes the, the bell curve, the mathematics of the dice. And that's why I think it works compared to just rolling it. If that game was roll a d20 and you might roll a one, it would be terrible. It would just reward the player who rolls the best. Meanwhile, it's a game very similar to Rally Man GT, which is all about mitigating your speed into the corners and making sure you don't bump other players. That is where there's a ton of randomness in Formula D is every time you go next to another player, you roll a D20. And if you roll the right number, I forget, it's like a 19 or 20, you um, you you crash. And if anyone's seen Will Wheaton play this on tabletop, they go nuts over this damage die and like there's special effects every time someone rolls it. That is highly random. I actually kind of don't like that rule in Formula D, but the actual dice you use for your gears work because they're not a full linear scale. Right. They've taken the math of rolling a dice and fixed it deliberately in order to give you a more enjoyable game. So they have reduced the randomness by changing the values on the yes. actual faces of the die. And that was Formula D. Next, I have Merchant of Venus. This is a really old, like way older than you expect. I think 70s sci-fi board game originally published by Avalon Hill. Uh, Fantasy Flight's the last people to have the license, and they put out a newer version, which I do have there be, behind me. This is a game, pick up and deliver in space, more constrained than Zaya. So it's similar in the fact that you are going to go to different planets, you're going to pick up goods and deliver them to other planets that want the goods, and you roll randomly, see how far you move. And that is a big aspect of the game that some people don't like. But what they have done in this is there's arrows on the board and they're in different colors for different routes and different engines get bonuses on different ones. And what will happen is you'll have three or four different ways to go. So a bad roll will still hurt and it doesn't remove all the choices. It does give you options. And again, that's that big thing for the, the roll and moves and why it works here is the options that are presented. So while I might not be able to make it all the excuse me, all the way to Mars this turn, maybe I can stop off at the satellite instead and pick up some extra goods before I get to Mars, right? So it has that aspect to it, which again, I didn't I didn't even think of it as a roller move when we did it. But that's also the reason I think it works in, in um, Pulsar is there's lots of different ways to go in Pulsar. If I've got a six move, I could go here, or I could go through here, or I could go through there. Again, giving that player more options to use the randomness that they are stuck with through a die roll. And that was uh, the original version from 1988 with the update okay. in 2012, Merchant of Venus. It's actually newer than I thought. I thought it was one my dad had, so I thought it was older than that. Still old as far as most people are concerned. Uh, next up is Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters, a game we mentioned on the show. It's not like we try to shoehorn it into all these, but it does seem to come up a lot. I got to admit, this is one I don't like, the roll and move aspect. Rolling a one in that game sucks but there's so much other good stuff going on in that game and cooperating and working together and the, the, the tension of trying to get rid of a ghost before a room becomes haunted. And then the expansion, adding more stuff in, I got to admit, I'll, I'll overlook it. Like I'm like, no, sorry. I, yeah, that's fine. I, yeah, I hate it. I hate rolling one. At least it's mitigated. When you roll a one, you don't put any ghosts out. So you get something. So actually a two actually kind of feels worse because <laughs> On a two, you're getting ghosts and you barely move. And then there's the additional rule you can't move through someone. And the worst is when you're on that last spot trying to get out of the house and someone's on the spot and you can't roll it so you can't get past them. And I've had it at the end of the game where you have all three kids standing in a row and the one in the back goes first. So on a one, two, and three, they can't move. I, I do wish, and this is something that would have been nice in the expansion, is there was some way to mitigate it, like some way to earn rerolls. Like when you defeat ghosts, collect them, and then you can trade in a ghost to get plus one. Like that, that would have fixed. There you go. I think I just came up with a, probably a pretty good house roll for ghost fighting treasure hunters. So yeah, I got to admit it. I, I hate the roll and move aspect, but this is one of those things where the, the sum of the parts is better. That, that one little part's a little, eh, but we just ignore that. And that is ghost fighting treasure hunters. Now we hinted at this one earlier and that is talisman. I know I listed this as one of the games I hate due to roll and move, but that is actually only the first three editions of talisman. Modern versions, uh, based on the fourth edition, have removed the requirement to roll exactly to land on certain spots. So now the Portal of Power 
if you go buy it, you can stop if you want to interact with it. Now, if you just want to draw a card and not try to get through the portal, you still have to roll exactly. Same thing with the Sentinel. You are free to just challenge the Sentinel. You have to be able to move through him. So you don't have to land on the spot. You have to be able to move through him. And as long as you can move through him, you can have a six, you can have a three, you can move through him. That really makes the game so much better. And they've also done other improvements in the fourth edition. I realize this isn't roll and move related, but they remove, reduce the amount of XP to level up. Uh, they give everyone a stat increase at the beginning of the game. And they have done a ton of things to reduce the play time from like six to eight hours down to a two hour game now. And, it, and all of these, of course, are making the game less random. And that was Talisman, specifically fourth edition and beyond. Yes which does include all the ones based on it. So um, Talisman Batman is the version I own. There's Talisman Kingdom Hearts, and there's Talisman Star Wars even mm -hmm. out there now. So all of those newer editions definitely do a lot to help with it. Next, I have an interesting one I have not talked about in a very long time. It's a game I really enjoyed uh, back in the 2000s. This is an abstract economic game called Basari. Now, what this does is you are rolling a d6 and you are moving your pawn one to six times. But where you move makes things more interesting. It's not like, like I landed on Park Place so I get to buy it or I landed here so I get something. So what it does is it determines the value of the gems that turn. So if, if anyone looks at a picture of the board, you'll see it. So if I land on this spot, it gets, shows three red gems. Well, three red gems go up for auction and the number on the die roll sets the price. Well, this is a huge trading game. This is a very open trading game. Like, I'll give you two red gems for a green gem. Well, this sets the base price. And why it works is it affects everyone. It's like Sean mentioned earlier with, um, what game was it we talked about that? Uh, Camel Up. The, the, the die roll changes the game state for every player. So it doesn't really matter. Now, what rolling high does in this is, yeah, it starts the opening bid, but it also moves you further around the track, which could cause the game to end sooner because the game ends as soon as someone's made a complete lap. But again... That affects everyone. It's it's not something that like you you're not making a decision. You're like, I want the game to end sooner. It just it's to make it so you don't know when the game's gonna end, which actually makes the game more interesting. Because if you had a set number, you could plan ahead a little bit more, which is not what you actually want in this fast trading game. This is supposed to be a, a rapid fire, I'll trade you this for this and this for this and this for this type of game. Uh, interestingly, there's a there's a couple of different rebuilds on this, but I'm not sure how if they've come to North America, because there's Basari um Edelstein and Reich, um, and then there's, or sorry, that's Edelstein and Reich and Bastari das, uh, Bastari das Kartenspiel. Um, that's no, that's uh, that's Bastari the card game, which is a different game, except it uses both the original Bastari and the and and Edelstein oh, and Reich and sort of expansion mashes them together. To okay, uh, whereas Edelstein and Reich is listed as one of the small boxes from Alia. See, this is a small box game. Okay. Now, the one I have is published by Yastari. This goes back. Like, this is one of the games I got, like, when I got into Catan and right. in Carcassonne. Like, this is where well, we're in, talking. In 2003, yeah, uh, <laughs> Idelstein and Reich came out, and that's the Aaliyah small box. Yeah, set. so as I said, it was early 2000s when I played this. So, really neat game. But again, you're rolling the die and moving, but it it's changes the board state. And that was Basari. Now... Next is Monza, which is a game we haven't recommended in a long time because my girls haven't been that young in a long time. This is a kid's game. It's one of the yellow Haba kids games. And I've got to say now I would call it Rally Man for Kids because it uses a similar mechanic. Now, my kids are well past this, but if you have kids, this is a great game for teaching dice rolling in color. This is Kills Candyland, right? If your argument is I use Candyland to teach my kids counting in colors, no, throw that out. Buy Monza. You make real decisions. Where this works is how people want Rally Man to work. I get a set of five dice, I roll them, and I have a track with all kinds of colors. And while I move forward by putting a die of the right color on the track, and then I put another die and another die. And the thing is, there is some thought process here because you have to plan ahead. Like, do I, if I use my white now, that means I can't use it later and stuff like that. Now, again, super simple kids game. It's only three tracks. You only go once around the track. It's, it's definitely a kids game. But again you still have lots of choices. Like, yes, you may be in front of you. You only have red and yellow. And while you rolled, a, you, you didn't roll a yellow and all you have is a red, you have no choice. But then usually on most turns, it's about picking which dice to use. Now, there is always an optimal move, but I think that's more about it being a kid's game than being a roll and move. 
And I should point out that there is a 2020 version, the Monza 20th anniversary version, oh, wow. which adds some new driver, uh, advanced driver variants and a new track that came Ooh. out last year. And that was Monza. All right, that I, I would recommend picking up. That sounds awesome. And just again, my kids are well past this game at this point. I should be teaching them Rally Man. I just don't have the physical <laughs> version. Uh, sticking with kids games, because I going through, again, I, we did some research on this, and I managed to find a really good list on Board Game Geek and found a way to sort it and stuff. This showed up, and I thought of it. And this is a great game if you like, again, Trouble, Sorry, Parcheesi, that style of game. So this is a kids game that my kids still play. This is one I'll sit down and play with them now. Um, this does the thing that backgammon does, because what you have is a bunch of mice, and I don't remember how many, it's five or six mice you put on a board, and you roll your dice, and you get to split up the pips to move one or more of your dice, more of your, your, your mice. And there's a cat on the board, and if you roll the six, I think it's to say, it's either the six or the one, the cat also moves, and the cat just moves set spots. But so what you're is, trying to do is... There is no six. It's one, one, two, three, four, five, and on the two ones, the cat moves. Oh, there you go. So, so again, there they've done the thing where they mitigate some of the randomness by changing the dice. So what you can do is, while you're doing this, it's, it's got to push your luck element because your mice can, instead of keep running around the track trying to get to cheese Vana at the end of the board, which is a huge six point wheels of cheese, you can duck off into people's houses. And if you duck off into a people's house, that mouse is now out of the game and will collect a piece of cheese. And while the first house has single piece wheels and then there's like double piece wheels up to quarter piece wheels and you get more cheese. At the end of the game, once everyone's mice have either reached cheese Vana or have been caught by the cats, you just count up how much cheese everyone's collected. So the things it does here is you've got a few different things. You can split up your pips. You got dice that are not a standard linear curve. They've been changed a little bit. And the fact that you have a push your luck element. Do you keep trying to run? Because what happens is the, the cat speeds up as it gets around the track. It starts jumping spots. So interestingly, uh, this is actually uh, called Viva Topo originally, uh, but is now renamed to Viva Mouse, M-A-U-S, mm -hmm. in the latest 2019 version. But that is Viva Topo or Viva Mouse. Viva Mouse. Didn't know that one. Next, I have a game I found at Origins. Um, Rio Grande Games does this really cool section of Origins. And it's the biggest hidden gem of Origins. Well, at least it was. We're going to assume it's the same. Where they have all their games you can play. And when you play them, you earn little tokens where you can trade them in. But the other thing is they provide food. So if you have no budget and you're at Origins, all you have to do is keep playing Rene, uh, Rio Grande games and they bring out food. So it's what we do when we want a snack. Um, they often put out pop and water um, and the, like they serve like tacos and stuff. It's, 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 don't tell too many people. While there, one time, uh, getting a snack before we had a big meetup later in the day for the Misdirect and Mark podcast, we're like, all right, we have played most of these. And this is where I tried out a few like Transamerica. We talked about a couple weeks ago. We tried that and we tried this game called Rattle Bones. Now, what this did was completely unique at the time, and it has now been used. But at the time, it was completely unique. Um, they've even reused the dice for this. It has plastic dice in three different colors, and all of the faces of the dice pop off and can be replaced by other plastic pieces. Now, I know like Dice Throne and some other games now do this, but at the time, it was totally unique. You're going to roll your three dice every round, and you're basically you're in a circus. You're playing little monkeys, and you're going around a track trying to earn victory points for doing various things. That part's not important. What's important is this makes roll and move work by letting you change your dice. You literally, your decision is, I'm going to change this. I don't want to roll this ever again, but I want to roll this more often. And it gives you, the player, complete control over the randomness of what's on the dice. This is a true hidden gem. I think it's brilliant. I want a copy, but it's out of print and hard to find. They totally stole the dice and reused them in the latest... Um, uh, race for the galaxy no roll for the galaxy expansion now includes these plastic dice it is such a neat game and and it's not just movement like you replace the pips with victory points and resources you can collect like the, there's all kinds I, I forget i'd have to look at it. it's like 33 different faces you can put on these dice it is a really neat game if you can find a copy i don't think they're ever going to reprint it because of the cost of these dice was higher than they had expected um but yeah and then the, the modern one that everyone knows is dice forge where, but it uses cardboard chips that may eventually run out. These, these were actual plastic printed, really nice pieces. So yeah, it fixes the problem by giving you complete control over the dice. So uh, 
I I'm going to I'm going to hate on this game for one simple reason and that's because their their uh their own text uses the term it's an experience to six-sided die for. Mm. And for that, this game <laughs> could go away. But that was rattle bones. Just glad all of our podcast listeners don't do that when they listen to you make puns. <laughs> Next, I have another horse racing game. All right, so this this to me is is Camel Up Advanced. This is this is the although it's way older. This is actually another one of those older games. I'm not going to say a year because it seems like I'm wrong on all of them lately. I always think these old games are older than they actually are. I want them to be older than me, I guess. Uh, the game is Long Shot. This is a horse racing game that's similar to Camel Up. Except in this case, you do start off by owning one horse. So out of all the horses on the board, every player is going to own one, and there will always be neutral horses. And yes, you roll to move that horse every round. But after moving the horse, you can then bet on the other horses, as well as purchase additional horses after the race starts. So you can bet it. Like You, you may have your horse you run, and yeah, you get a bonus if your horse finishes win, place, or show. But your real points are for betting on who wins when plays the show, whether it's you or not. And this has some interesting random things where you randomize which horse moves and then roll to see which moves. This is, until Camel Up came out, my favorite like horse racing game, like that style of race. This is much more strategic and tactical than Camel Up because, well, there's no silly stacking and things going backwards and cameras to get you bonus spots or oasises to slow things down. This is almost like just purely random. The horses are going to move. But it's that fact that you get to do the bet, right? Like, yes, you start with one horse, and there are reasons you can try to do better things for that horse, but you also can be like, no, my horse has no chance. I'm going to invest all my money on other stuff. So uh, this is a 2009 game. Uh, Interestingly, just this year in 2021, Mm -hmm. there is a purely dice version of the game coming up, which is Long Shot the Dice Game. Yeah, I saw that when I was doing the research, and I'm like, they're going to make Long Shot more random? <laughs> but that was Long Shot. All right, last game I've got tonight. Favorite roll and move games. It's a Milton Bradley classic game of post apocalyptic vehicular combat, and that is thunder road which actually is a grail game for a number of people i happen to find my copy at an antique mall in london ontario but it's missing the black die which is one of the things that fixes this game so yes it's highly random um this is a roll the dice pick which of your three vehicles to move you have two ground vehicles and a chopper there is a thing where if you get your vehicles off the edge of the map anyone who's still on the last board gets eliminated so yes there's a big whoever rolls higher tends to get an advantage but there are a couple things done to help with the dice. So first off is the fact you have three vehicles. So you're going to split up your dice. And you have to split them up because you don't want any one of those vehicles falling behind. Or do you so that you can spend your dice to keep your other vehicles going? So there's your decision, right? Your interesting decision is, do I sacrifice one of the vehicles? Then there's the fact the board has wasteland, but down the middle is the blacktop. You have actual pavement. And while if any of your ground vehicles are on the pavement, you get this bonus die that actually has higher numbers on it. And you get to roll that in addition to the other dice so you can really zoom. Well, that's cool and thematic, but kind of random. But what I like is that adds an area, not area control, but like you are going to fight over that middle because of that bonus, which just adds a thematic element. And the whole battling for the center is such a big part of the game. So yeah, it's a bit of a dice fest, but such a good game. Like, it, it really is. It, like, for a classic Milton Bradley toyerific game, it is really well done. Interestingly, a lot of people have made their own black dyes to go with that game. I think that's... It, like, the thing is, I got it, and I thought they were all just D6s, and it ends up the, the black is not. Yeah. So I, I'm like, ooh, okay. That is not... Sorry, it's not bigger. It's like the, the normal D6 dice, it's like one to three, but it's in addition to the other dice. Right. I shouldn't say it's higher numbers. It's in addition to the other dice. And that was Thunder Road. Coming up next, we're going to have some honorable mentions like we often do in our recommendations. I like to throw these in, right? Because there's, for one, we do research before we do these shows, right? And and we look up stuff. And what I tend to watch for is if I see lots of people saying, this is the best roll and move game, even if I don't like it, I feel the need to share it with you folk. I like, if everyone else loves it, you're probably going to love it too, right? Not everyone has the same taste in games as I do. 
Um, plus, there's another one I had to throw on here because I didn't know if we were going to allow it or not. And I, I don't even know what our an- I final still answer know if was. It or not. Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to put Rally Man GT here. Is it a roller move? I don't know. I, you, I, I think it is. Sean still, it, I think he's a little closer to my side than when we started this, but he's still not over the fence. So Rally Man GT, um, to me, this is racing using dice done right. Whether you call it roll and move or not, it works so well. You plan out your turn and then hope the dice are on your side. It changes it from being purely random to a push your luck game. And I love that aspect. Like, I'm so glad Sean got me into this game. And I I need to get a physical copy of this at some point. We don't need it now because we can't get together and play anyway. But soon, (laughs) at some point, maybe they'll do another Kickstarter. Because they had a Kickstarter with, like, all the expansions. Go all in on it because I have really enjoyed Rallyman GT. And that was, as said, Rallyman GT. Maybe. Maybe. (laughs) Next is a game that everyone seems to love but me. I don't know why. It is Jamaica, a pirate-themed racing game with a ton of take-that elements. This is a try to get around the board, but also collect a lot of treasure along the way and fight other people with this kind of rock, paper, scissors element. Um, This is on most of the Roll and Move best lists I saw when I Googled it. Our chat room, I noticed, has brought this game up. A couple different people in the chat have brought up Jamaica. I don't know. I tried it. I tried it three times. First time I played with two players. That was a mistake. I don't even know board game geek says you can play it with two players. I, it, that was not good. That was just the person who got ahead, stayed ahead and won. So that kind of sucked. I then tried it with three players and it was better, but not great. And then I tried it once at like five or something. I don't know what the max is six or something. I think I tried it with five players. Yeah. So I tried it with five. So I never tried it with a max player count and it, I don't know, just didn't do it for me. I, I, you know what? I'm not huge on take that games. Like, it, it kind of had that munchkin feel of whoever's in the lead, you're all going to beat up, which caused them to fall back. I don't know. I, it wasn't for me, but people love it. People love Jamaica. But to me, I you know, I've never played the game. Uh, I've looked at the, the BGG listing, but your description of it makes it sound like Mario Kart. Yeah. And oh, no, I, I think that's fair. Mario Kart. So I honestly think that's fair. There we go. That was Jamaica. Next is Deep Sea Adventure. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about this game. This is from Oink Games. Oink produces, they're, they're from Japan, and they produce these little tiny, I don't know, they're like boutique games. The, the, their price point to me is way higher than they should be for a bunch of cardboard and wooden bits. And that's one of the things that's kept me away from them. But from what I understand, this game's fantastic. I know people who love Deep Sea Adventure and other games from Oink, and this has some kind of strong push-your-luck element, and there's something about rolling dice to see how deep you get. But to be honest, I, I didn't even know this was a roller move until doing research for this episode. So I learned that Deep Sea Adventure is a roller move that a lot of people dig. And I had no clue it was a roller move. There we go. And that was Deep Sea Adventure. Well, that's it for our discussion on roll and move games and our list of favorite roll and move games. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see what they thought about it all. All right, lobbyists, what do you have for us? What are some of your favorite roll and move games and or some of your thoughts on the topic or our definitions or lack thereof? <laughs> I gotta say this was one of, our chat was busy the entire time from start to finish. Since since the first lobby till we just finished topping, it has been scrolling by. Yep. It has been going by. So so Board Game Geek does agree with me that, that Rally Man is a rolling rate. Yep. I, I, roll, and move. I, I, roll and move. Roll and move. That's, this is this now has I'm been an ongoing it. problem for days yes. now. Yes. I, I think I was fine for the whole actual segment. Yeah. No, I, I don't. Th- I didn't hear any uh, glitches. Now, here's an interesting thing that came up between uh, Danielle and I in the chat room. Okay. So, she doesn't think that uh, can't stop is a roll and move because there's a chance where you cannot roll, move when you roll. Okay. The problem with that definition is. That makes Monopoly not a roll and move because if you're in jail and roll the dice and don't get the right number and don't pay the money, you don't get to move, even See, though I don't, you've rolled. I think the jail mechanic is outside the roll and move. That is a different mechanic in Monopoly. That is the effect of one spot. So that would be like saying in Talisman, when I get to the center thing and I have to dice with death, I roll 3d6. My person on my right rolls 3d6. Whoever rolls the highest wins. No, another thing they remove from later versions. How dumb is that? 
purely random. It's stupid. It's a stupid rule. That's gone in fourth edition. But that isn't roll and move. You're trying to outdice someone. Right. But that doesn't stop Talisman from being a roll and move. That's an effect of one spot. I would say the jail is the and uh, that rule for the jail is the effect of one spot in a larger roll and move game. Right. What? Well, uh, so I don't know. I I. I because there's I, the three doubles I, I in Monopoly tempted. too. Three doubles in Monopoly. You go to jail. You don't get to move the, your based on the randomness. Uh, yeah, that, that. But you are moving to jail. There is a result. If you get three negatives, you've rolled. You now move to jail. But I mean, in the same time, the the result in can't stop is a negative, right? You, yeah. You roll and you can't move because of what you've rolled. I think the big one. It's and why interesting. It's an interesting aspect. Yes. Of, no, of I get. It. I, th I think the big reason that Rally Man shouldn't be and can't stop shouldn't be is the same thing, is that your roll, you either move one or not. Right. It's not. You don't move the it's, result of the roll. Right. It's the. It's I think the binary that's what, But then I don't know how Rally Man stays on the list if can't stops not. That's yeah. that, like I, I could definitely see that argument, and I honestly think not moving is an option. I, I don't think that removes it from a roll and move. Right. Like, like, um, here's an example of I, I can't see anyone arguing that Formula D is in a roll and move. When you start the game, you can jump up in a gear, but if you roll the lowest number in a die, you stall out. And I think Rally Man has some mechanic like yeah, that too when the you're rolling at zero. Start to, the rolling start yeah. rule. But you could not move. Right. Can't stop. You made the choice to keep rolling until you can't. Yes, that is an aspect. Yep. But the fact that, yeah, you may not move. Hero Quest, when you roll, you don't have to move. That's a good example, too. So, yeah, Hero Quest came up in the chat. I totally agree. That is a great roll and move game. Uh, it's too light for me, like, to be honest. I love Advanced Hero Quest, which is a roll and move game, too. But then we found a broken mechanic in it where everyone just sat outside the door for an entire round until initiative was started. Then they'd open the door and they'd just fight the monsters as they came out one at a time through the door, which was lame. And no, it wasn't thematic, but I played with Power Gamers back then. And there was no actual rule in the game to mitigate it. Like you made a wandering monster roll every round to see if an ogre came because you're hanging out in the hallway. That might have fixed it. Right. But yeah, Hero Quest definitely. Um, most dungeon crawls, though, got rid of it because people didn't like that in Hero Quest. And I got to say, the most boring part of Hero Quest is when you've cleared out the room and then you have to go wandering and trying to find the next door. And why am I rolling? Like, just let us teleport to the next door. And I used to do that. I'd be like, because everyone's just going to move there. And then you're going to wait until the dwarf or whatever catches up. And then once everyone's there, you're going to go in the room. So why even make me roll the move? Why not just teleport? Right. Uh, now, what I want to do is I'm going to jump into the Discord, which hopefully won't kill our uh, thing that was mentioned, quality. Uh, Ryan mentions, there was an era where games with rolling and moving make money. So yes. any game that wants to make money will include that mechanism somehow com with comfort and tradition. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's part of it is there was an era where the stock market was king and the stock market was everything and, and people were going to make it rich or, or dreamed about making it rich through mm -hmm. the stock market and the stock market uh, in to the, to the popular opinion is randomness making, you know, money. It's, it's, it's a, it's a different form of lottery. It's rich people's lottery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what is lottery, but you know, putting down some money and rolling a dice to see what happens. Uh, and there's a lot of games that used that sort of, vague understanding of stock market ideas and randomness mm -hmm. ideas as well as you know progression and what you ended up with when you when you when you put those ideas together when you think about stock markets and randomness and and progression to an end an end point you get roll and move i mean that's that's just sort of what happens that was something i saw in the chat that there had to be a destination and I don't agree with that one because then Zaya doesn't count. Well, neither does Monopoly. Well, you are looping the board. <laughs> Again, there's but no yeah, there's no end it's, real destination. It's a, it's a end a circle. So um, here is a list from Jess Seuss, uh, who hasn't actually played them, but they're ones like he's heard <laughs> people talking about and his friends like. So we have Zaya, Camel Up, and Jamaica. So yeah, we agree with all of those. I'm not a fan of Jamaica. Um, Bike Guy Dave says. Um, a game his daughter made for school. Here is a complaint about rolling moves. Teachers, stop making your kids make god dang rolling moves that are just land on a spot and do a thing, which is often either roll again or move backwards. Like just teach them better board games. Like they're out there. There are companies that will send you teaching resources for this stuff. The last rolling move I actually played was Welly Can Land, 
which was all about drinking and raiding beer while you roll a move. You know what? It worked because the rest of the game was fun, which we talked about. I think a lot of what a lot of what happens is, and this goes to the teaching thing. Um, I see it in um, RPG online RPG stuff. People want to, you know, people want to make a game, so they make a roll and move. And it's I mean, one, it's comfortable and it's familiar, so that's yeah. one of the reasons. But a lot of it is the roll and move is just a mechanic equivalent to drawing a random card right so you've got a path and the path is a bunch of colors and you don't know which color you're going to land on until you roll the dice and then when you land on that color you pick you know a challenge or a card from something based Mm -hmm. on that uh and that's a lot of so it's just a way to add an extra layer of randomization beyond shuffling a deck or shuffling multiple which is supposed to make it more interesting but doesn't always do so again it depends on the on your end goal if the goal Mm -hmm. is just to do something fun when you draw a card and land on a spot. Yeah. It's 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 a way to do it. You know, it's it suits the purpose. So yeah, Bike Guy Dave does mention Talisman. We I think covered that one in quite a bit of detail. Um talks about when he was a kid. Once he played uh oh he doesn't have the name, so that doesn't work. <laughs> uh we've got Dungeons and Dragons Monopoly, yes. Yep, yep. Uh, so here's Jeff's definition. If you play a game that has roll the dice, move that many spaces, do what it says on the space, that's a crap game. If you have a game that says roll the dice, make some interesting choices informed by the die roll and move, then you have a good game that isn't really doing what we hate about rolling moves, which I think fits pretty well. But he really threw in that roll the dice and move, yeah. but having a decision point. Uh, interestingly, um, Courtney's got uh, Twister on his list and i have to say i disagree <laughs> um, i don't think so I, I don't i don't think that's a that's a roll and move that's again you're just placing it onto a spot right you're not actually making you, you, a well move. again you're in uh, yeah you're not getting anywhere there's no progression yeah i think that's the problem there i think there has to be some kind of progression towards some goal which i guess the goal in twister is not fall down but that's not really based on where you're moving to right so I don't know if he's repeated them all in the chat, but he, I've got a list from him here of which, wow, there's a lot of overlap here, which is not <laughs> what we expected. Hero Quest, Camel Up, Jamaica, Formula D, Rally Man, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Then Twister, which we just talked about, Cranium. Now, Cranium to me is a move to a spot and do the interesting thing on the spot. So it's just a way to randomize what little mini game you play. Right. And I think that qualifies as a good roll and write because again the other stuff is what makes it interesting the roll and moves just a randomizer you could draw a card and do the thing game of life i actually think game of life is a great example of a classic roll and move that was good because the path split and mm-hmm. there were meaningful decisions on do you do you turn to the life of crime and take the shortcut this is the old life i don't know what the new ones the new one's all happy and shiny and you can get pets and i don't think any bad things happen to you but like you're like, which house should I buy? Because the mortgage is higher on this house than the other, and it was a valid decision. Yep. So Clue, uh, life, I agree. Clue, I think, is terrible because of roll move. That's that's to me what ruins Clue. You could end up with less clues than all the other players because you kept rolling ones, and I think that's a terrible mechanic. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. does, uh, people enjoy Talisman, but for nostalgia's sake, again, give the fourth edition a chance, uh, or any of the ones based on the fourth edition. No, it's not a shining, oh my god, it's an amazing game. You can see my Batman Talisman review on the blog or here on YouTube. Uh, and she games brings up Rat Race from 1967. Wow. Which was, uh, she imagined back in the as a kid, the better than Monopoly game. Yeah, she described that one in the chat, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it sounds like Talisman, because you start with like crappy jobs on the outside of the board and eventually level up and get to move to the inside, which sounded so much like the Outer Kingdom to the Inner Kingdom to the Center Kingdom and Talisman to me. Monopoly meets Talisman without without the big boss and the big bad guy yeah. in the middle. Now, Danielle mentioned Sword and Skull. I That one, like, totally just, I don't remember at all, and Ruin. Like I, I have not played either of those. Yeah, Sword and Skull is 2005 uh, pirate-themed. Uh, yeah, I would have guessed with that name, but yeah, like, pirate, I, I know nothing about Avalon that Avalon Hill. Avalon Hill, okay. Yeah, it's a it's a 5.5, so you might not have heard of it. Well, yeah, it's a roller <laughs> move. Yeah. Uh, and then Ruin from Buffalo Games. Ruin, no. 
Bruin from 2008 from Buffalo Games. There we are. Yeah. Uh, 5.6. Uh, Better rating. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, modular board. There, that's where See, it gets there the, you uh, go. That's where it gets the better rating from. That's fair. So uh, Razuel was mentioning a shopping mall game where you had to roll and move to different stores and collect things. That would be Mall Madness. There we go. Which actually has been reprinted. That game, if you can find the original copy, is worth a fortune because of the board. The, it was a plastic mall with a grid on it. That is so great for you got a time travel D&D game where you get warped into reality or you want to fight zombies in a mall. Yeah, Mall Madness. There is a new version, and it's all cardboard's garbage. Like, try to find the 80s version. So the interesting thing I'm seeing about Ruin here is that it has this giant D20. Like, okay, massive. Uh, I think it's a D20. I can't quite tell. Does it come with the game? It's not just some board game geek users. Yeah, no, it's this. Un- it's got this unique. Oh, it is 20-sided, oh. yeah, and it's huge. Like, someone took a picture of it next in their hand, and it's, like, oh, you know, geez. big. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, not ones we know. Uh, I'll try to remember to throw them in the notes because uh, D's not here to be adjusting our notes as we go. Oh, interestingly, the dice actually has two functions in Ruin. It said it's two colored die. Yeah, so the dice has a red background. You swap out a card in the path, and then the number is how far you move uh, your pawns. So part of the modular board in, in Ruin is you're actually messing with other people's boards, oh, yeah. apparently. So uh, other ones that like didn't make the list that I considered was Labyrinth um magic labyrinth so this is a game that uses magnets and invisible walls but they're not invisible they're under the board so you can't see them but you roll to see how many spaces you move every turn and that works well enough but again i think you could have gave everyone five points i think it's to mitigate the fact that the walls are in random places uh cade to the kingdom is another one where every time you move you move the demon king well that's cool next time we get the game together daniel will bring them instant to learn so simple ones Overall, I, I don't know. It's fine. It's a mechanic. Like like my overall thoughts on Rilla Move, I don't think negatively of it anymore. I used to. I have no interest in playing your pasted on theme, move a spot, and then do a thing. Like I have absolutely no interest in that. Closest I'll ever get is Talisman. Um, another one that was on a lot of lists was Runebound, which is to me a modern Talisman. Right. Uh, the Specifically the third edition. I haven't played the third edition. I played the second edition and it had one of the coolest roll and move mechanics where you had terrain dice and you would roll five of them and you could only move through the terrain that you rolled the right dice and certain ones were barely on there like mountains were only one side of the dice forests were say two sides whereas roads were or whatever planes were like the other three sides i don't remember the exact numbers here so it was neat because you'd roll but then you'd decide what to do based on your roll so you're like okay i have two mountains and a forest so i can reach this town or i could start heading off this way but it, oh, I, oh lakes i think was another one or water was another one single die one so it's like oh i can cross the river this turn though i'm not going to get far but then i'll be across it to be able to do this thing next turn i thought that was fascinating i actually really liked that mechanic i don't know if third edition used that I like the dice in that so much that I got a backup set because I was worried I was going to wear through them (laughs) because I just, I thought they were also great for D&D. So what I would do is I would be running a fantasy role-playing game and the players would be like, I go to this town and I play fairly improv, not completely improv, but fairly improv. And I'm like, I honestly, as a DM, don't know what's between these two. And if I just run off my head, it's going to be a forest with a road on it because that's just where I default when I think medieval fantasy. So I would roll these dice and be like, you have to pass through this type of terrain, this type of terrain, this type of terrain. And then I would put one encounter in each of the two, three types of terrain. No, not always combats. But I use those dice all the time for fantasy RPGs because they were great for coming up with terrain types. And so third edition does have custom etched uh, dice. terrain dice. Yep. From what I understand, they changed the combat system to like a flip. You like flip poker chips or something. Oh, hold on. This one. Oh, this is somebody's custom. Uh, somebody made them. I oh, don't think okay. they do have them anymore. Anyway, but that that's one I almost put on the list. But to be honest, I the second edition's so out of print, and I have no idea if the third edition's the same. So I didn't want to throw that on there. Looks like third edition is tokens. Yeah. See, that's a, you. You either like bag pull them or something, and that just didn't sound as cool to me. Though the game is rated higher, so maybe it's good. It's a seven that, five. Yeah, that's pretty good for yeah. for but i don't know is it even a roll and move because i saw it on people roll and moves list but uh, well right. maybe it's a rando and move right if you're pulling chips it's i guess yeah, the same result geek just crashed on me oh um, terrible you broke board game geek yeah, apparently how dare <laughs> you break the word game geek it's got, it's got I, too I, many I, different I, mechanisms That's there the is problem. so much <laughs> in the chat did we cover 
a good portion of it? Did I, we I miss think we got a lot of it in there. Like, like feel free to repeat stuff. yourself. <laughs> I, I jumped in there and, and was was chatting with people along the way. Is Gaslands a rolling move? <sighs> it is very similar to. No, I well, if, if Rally Man is yes, then Gaslands is. So, Gaslands is more like X Wing. You pick a template. And you put it out in front of your Matchbox car, Hot Wheels. Sorry, I grew up with Matchbox. You put Matchbox is gone. Put it in front of your Hot Wheels car, and then it's going to tell you the difficulty of that particular maneuver, and you're going to roll dice. And if you roll enough successes, you end up at the end of the template. But if you fail, you spin out, which there's a place to attach your car on the other end. So to me, that's the same as Rally Man. So if we're depending on where we put Rally Man, that's where Gaslands belongs. So here's here's an interesting one. If that is going to be, or if we were to make that a rolling move, I would have to put Blood Bowl as a rolling move because of the additional movement. So yes, you get a yep. X number of movements, but then to go, you if you want to run push for, your luck. if you want to push your luck, you would yeah. all of a sudden make to Blood honest, Bowl a rolling move. I googled move. Blood Bowl today because I couldn't remember if you rolled to see how far you got to move your guys. You don't. It's no. based on one of their stats. Yeah, but I couldn't remember. So I actually looked it up. And to be honest, there, there we get into that same thing, right, with the, the randomness. Well, what if you move past them? They have to roll to see if they tackle you. Is that roll and move because they're rolling, and if they succeed, you stop moving, and if you fail, you keep going? Then we're getting into the rally man thing again. Right. I, I'm, I'm definitely I'm, I'm going more Sean's way the more we talk about it, to be honest. Even uh, can't stop. Runebound, Runebound uh, third edition is listed as the roll slash spin and move. I don't see, know. I don't no know. No actual confirmation, right? That's I uh, Yeah, I saw that does. today. Um, but I can't find any dice on it. So other than the cus the custom one people have made, so I think it's a bag puller. Yeah, well, it's still random. It's yeah. Still a random move, rando move. I mean, no, I, if, if, if I'm going to give spins and dice, random. I mean, you know, it'd be in random output. Yeah, random output move. So Ryan mentioned playing Talisman in the '90s. It was a yawn fest due to lack of agency, in which whatever direction I chose didn't feel like it mattered. So that is another aspect of Talisman that is definitely a thing. Now I don't know. I always have a goal when I'm playing Talisman. I'm trying to get to this spot where I can roll to get this next thing I'm going to need to progress. Now, maybe that's just because I played the game hundreds of times, but I never found like, yeah, sometimes it's draw a card to draw a card. But if I'm going that way, that means it's bringing me closer to the chapel and I'm good alignment. And I want to go to the chapel to see if I happen to get lucky and roll six and gain a craft. Like I know that. So it, it did matter which way I went. And I might want to go that way just for the chance of hitting the chapel and lose a life because I know that one of the other options on the blessed spot is if I roll a four or five, I get that life back. And then I'm going to move off and keep trying to go back until I can buff my craft and that'll let me win the game, right? Like that's how I play Talisman. So I think a lot of it is not knowing the cards in the deck and knowing, especially if you don't know what all the spots on the board do, especially the corners all do interesting things. If you don't know your odds of getting those things, if you don't know that going to the 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 one in the one corner it's you roll two dice, but if you roll six or less, it's bad. And if you roll six or more, it's good. Well, you don't go there until you got a fate point. Then you do it. And then there's a better chance. Like, I just, I know that. I've internalized all that because I played way too much talisman back in the day. And to me, there are valid things. But if you don't know better, if you're just like, all right, I rolled a C. What are my two options? Draw a card to draw a card. And you're not looking ahead or picking a destination. It is way too random because you don't know better. Right. But is that a problem with the game or players' experience with it? uh zaya ryan wants it but it's too expensive fair totally yep. fair yeah, it no, is not a, a cheap game it's an investment absolutely uh but you talisman get a lot of game Legend out of it so hmm? you do get a lot of game out of it yeah of you it do the price talisman legendary tales is not a rolling right really i i like that game but there's not a lot in common with talisman i think we're probably good at this point so key to the kingdom yeah i'm not saying anything else on here we're good remember if you've got a game or game night question for us all you got to do is head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. There it is. Lost and notes. now we have a review of the Master Taylor's Poltergeist expansion for Aventuria, the card game, adventure card game. Big thanks to Ulysses Steele for sending us this, along with other Aventuria products, to check out. Master Taylor Poltergeist, or the legacy of Dugon de Montrazo, was designed by Michael Palm and Luke Gassac, uh, the designers of Aventuria. This is an expansion for the Aventuria adventure card game, which is designed to be the perfect introduction to Aventuria for one to four players. 
A duel with this set will only take about 10 minutes, with the cooperative adventure taking maybe about half an hour. Now, you do need to own the core box to be able to use this expansion. Now, I went searching, and I was not able to find an MSRP for this demo kit. It was originally offered as a backer reward for people who took part in the last adventure at Kickstarter, and I actually don't know if it's actually coming to retail at all. Now, I have seen this for sale, but only in Europe and not in or with a lot of stock, so it's mm -hmm. difficult, if not impossible, to pick up. Still, if you plan on teaching people regularly, well, you'll see. So this small box expansion provides a beginner adventure, four pre-made beginner hero decks that can be used to play either a short duel or an included short but rather fun whimsical adventure. If you're curious to know more about this game, though, like of Aventurio, the game this expands upon, be sure to check out our Aventuria Adventure Card Game review. It was on last week's podcast episode. You can also catch a written review on the blog, and there'll be a YouTube version up soon. Also, look for the uh, look at the cards and the small instruction books you get with this expansion. Feel free to check out our Master Tailors Poltergeist unboxing video on YouTube. Now, this expansion comes in a small card pack. Like, it's just like a deck of cards. That's it. It's got 55 cards and a small six-page adventure booklet. The cards, thankfully, match the quality in the court game perfectly and are broken into three different sets of cards. You've got seven henchmen, all for fans of Aventuria, you want to know this, have the supernatural spirit and servant keywords. There are three adventure cards and four hero decks. Now, these hero decks only contain 11 cards each. Five of them are action cards. The six are these new endurance cards. Now, I've got no complaints about the components here. Actually, I'm impressed by how much you get in such a tiny little box. Now that we know what you get with this adventure, uh, Aventuria expansion, how about how do you use this expansion content? All right, so the point of this expansion is to be an, an introduction, right? This was actually created originally as a demo kit uh, to show off a game at cons or for fans to teach their friends or other public play events. But it actually works great for your own personal game group as well. And that's what I did with it is I used it to teach my wife how to play the game. Now, the reason this works as an introduction is that it prevents, presents a much simplified version of the main game. Uh, it's much simplified version of the heroes, as well as a really short sample adventure with some rules removed to make things even easier. Because in a normal game, you've got a hero deck of 30 cards. Well, now you only have a deck of 18 cards. And what they did was the, they removed a lot of the decision points of the full game while still keeping the feel. Like, you're not going to have to worry about which cards to convert to Endurance. So, it's tough when you don't know the full makeup of your deck, or at least don't have it memorized. You don't really know what you're going to need later. So, flipping those Endurance cards uh, in the normal game without this expansion uh, can be tough and, and, and yeah. you know, stress-inducing. Yeah, it's actually, to me, it's, it's the most important decision in the game, in a way. And it removes that, which I, but without changing the overall feel. Now... <laughs> They also simplified this game by giving you four decks that are, come pre-sorted, so you don't even shuffle them. And each deck only has five unique cards in it, action cards in them, which are the cards you're going to draw for your starting hand to five. So everyone starts with all their available cards in their hand. The rest are just endurance cards, and they literally say on them, this card is an endurance card. So normally in a normal game, you would draw two cards at the start of your hand, put them in your hand, pick two cards, turn into endurance. Gone. Don't worry about that. Just take two of the cards off your deck and throw them face down in front of you as your endurance for the rest of the thing. Really simple. Now, while this removes an important aspect of the game, it does so in a way that lets you focus on playing the game without fretting about resource mm -hmm. management. Exactly. Now, when playing a demo or learning game of Venturia with these beginner decks, there are some rules that are changed. So you follow all the rules of the core game, except the heroes don't have special abilities. So you don't have to worry about those. Critical hits and fumbles are ignored during combat, though they are still used in the narrative phase in the short adventure. Fate points, while you still earn them on a miss, you can only use them to reroll. So no drawing cards or any of the other aspects. And when fighting a duel, you only start with 20 life instead of 40. Now, the beginning of your adventure features a very short narrative phase with one check. So it basically gives you a chance to teach everyone how to make a skill check. And then you get into this rather entertaining and whimsical combat and I'm going to spoil it just slightly, but I think you can guess it by the name, where you're going to fight some animated garments. This combat features a unique hero action, 
and you're not going to be able to win just by beating up all this close. So what are your final thoughts on this Aventuria demo kit? So I am so glad that when Ulysses Spiel sent us the stuff to check out, they included this demo kit. This small deck of cards and beginner adventure really are a great way to learn the game. I loved how the simplified 11 card decks removed the most difficult decisions from the game while still keeping it interesting. Because just because you don't have to worry about endurance doesn't mean that it's obvious which of your five action cards you want to play and when you want to play them and what you want to spend that endurance on. Yeah, I have to say the modified rules are in part how I ended up playing anyways. I <laughs> still haven't actually used a special ability uh, or drawn cards with fate points. It's just less to think about while yeah. I've been learning that deck of cards, which is what happens, uh, you know, when you play this. this version. Yes. So duels are super fast. Like, like 20 health is not much. Uh, you're going to start with your basic weapons, do D6, right? They are great for learning the basic mechanics of playing the cards, using endurance, taking actions in combat. And the other thing that I thought was cool, too, is they, they were smart. All the action cards you do get, the five you do get, are handpicked to be basic and simple. None of them have different ways to play in the different modes. All of them are permanent. So you actually don't ever have to worry about timing issues or using cards on another player's turn. And by removing critical hits means you don't ever have to worry about drawing from your deck or discarding cards either. You're going to have these cards in play or they'll be in your hand. This lets you or the players focus on the core rules without getting caught up in card combos and minutia. Now, the cards you do get are a nice mix. Like you have some buffs, you have some weapons, you have some cards that allow you to make checks and some armor it does actually i was surprised how well they do a good job of showing off each of the four different characters and how they're different from each other like the the small subset of the cards they give you do a good job of at least kind of showing how those decks play in the full game yeah i would again all the basic mechanics are there just distilled down to what matters most for mm -hmm. easy learning and I gotta say, I was really excited to try this adventure. If you watch my uh, unboxing video, you can see my mounting excitement as I check out these henchmen cards. Because I'm like, oh, wow, look, these are all like sets of clothing and they're medieval clothing. And like their actions are like flutters about frantically or flutters about in an elegant manner. And I'm like, oh, I want to play a game where I battle sentient clothes. That sounds awesome. And now having played it, I'm really happy to see that it wasn't just beat up the clothes. It could have very easily done that. That's what I expect from a demo of a card game like this. You're going to show off me a quick combat where I just beat the bad guys and it's not going to take too many rounds, but I'm pleased to see they didn't go this way and I'm not going to spoil where they did go. Yeah, they really do seem to enjoy putting thought and plot into their adventures, including skill checks that both make sense and mm -hmm. have impact. Now, another aspect I appreciate from this is they could be more than just a demo kit to teach it. Because all of these are like valid Adventuria cards. They have a symbol in the corner to indicate they come from this set, but that's it. Most of the hero cards are non-unique cards that you could use for deck building if you combine it with the core set. Similarly, there's nothing stopping you from taking the henchmen here and throwing them into your henchmen deck. Means that you could end up running into magical garb in future adventures. So if you really want more bad guys to fight, you can decide after you run into them the first time. That's true, you get to see them. Now, what I like about these henchmen, too, uh, besides being animated clothes, which is just cool, is the fact they're only threat level two. Now, there are no threat level twos in the core box. So these are a simplified, easier monster that I think are cool because they're going to fill out that threat level. Again, listen to the full review if you don't know what I'm talking about with threat level. But, like, if you do put any animated clothes out, they're going to be kind of like a bonus, right? When they're mixed in with the rest of the poltergeist and undead, be like, oh, now we got a couple easy-to-defeat opponents that are there while not really watering down to the deck because it's such a low threat level. You would have to draw three of these cards to equal a five-level threat orc. Now, I find there's a, a real bedknobs and broomsticks vibe here, though I realize I have probably just seriously dated myself by <laughs> that reference. Yeah, that, I haven't seen that in years. Now, one complaint I do have about this box is you need the core set. This is not a standalone thing. This, this does not include the full rules. Um, you're going to need things like the hero cards, the, the tokens, the health trackers, um, the, the fate tokens, and all that stuff. Now, as far as I know, the only way to get this kit is through a Kickstarter where you get the core rules. So I guess it's not a problem, right? If they're going to come together. But if it is for sale in the future, it's not like this is a starter set. Which does lead to the, the biggest problem is, as far as I know, the only way to get this is from that Kickstarter or people who got it in the Kickstarter selling copies. 
Now, that only ended like earlier this year, 2021. So it is possible that this will be sold separately in the future. They've definitely marketed it as a standalone product. Like if you look at it, it's got the barcodes and everything on it to be sold. But I actually don't know if you're going to be able to buy this. And even going on Board Game Geek, all that's there is the German version. They don't even have a listing for the English version yet. Now, I did see some copies for sale in the Board Game Geek market, but as of today, those are gone. Yep. No, uh, I ran into it listed on some European sites again, but your mileage may vary. And yeah. who knows, maybe on the next time they, they put out a Kickstarter, they'll offer it as an add-on again. This is the kind of thing, too, I think once cons start up, you'll probably be able to pick up at like an Origins or a Gen Con. Now, the reason I'm saying this is I honestly think Master Taylor's Poltergeist is a perfect demo kit. And you're going to want to try to find a copy of this because this is a great introduction to the world of Aventuria. It's a fast, fantastic way to not just learn the game, but to get you excited for more. It does a great job of presenting a simplified, quicker version of the game without losing the feel of the full game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, if you are thinking of picking up Aventuria, try to find a copy. That's the best I can say at this point. Uh, if you already own Aventuria here, here's, the, here's, I think, the important question. And you know how to play. You still might want to pick this up. For one, the short adventure is cute and fun, and it's good for a nice filler. Like If you want a filler version of Aventuria, you're not going to have to play for an hour, hour and a half to get through this adventure. So it's a nice little cute filler. And most of the cards can be added to the core set. So it'll let you do some deck building without having to cannibalize the other decks. And I do like the fact the henchmen can be thrown in with your henchman deck. Plus, you never know. You may want to teach the game to someone new or bring it out to a local game store. This would be a great place to be able to pull the cards out, because Aaron mentioned, and use it to teach the game again. Yeah, if you are the, you know, the local teacher of games, it's definitely something that's good to have in your back pocket if you want to push other people into buying more Adventuria and having more fun yourself. Well, that's it for our review for Master Taylor's Poltergeist for the Aventuria Adventure card game. I welcome you to also check out the written review of this expansion over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And just before I jump over, are we jumping straight over or are we... Yeah, we'll do it. Okay. That didn't take that long. Okay. Welcome to a review of the Arsenal of Heroes expansion for the Aventuria Adventure card game. Big thanks to Ulysses Spiel for sending us this, along with some other cool Aventuria products to check out. Arsenal of Heroes expansion for Aventuria was designed by the designers of the basic game, Michael Palm and Lucas Sack. No, you will need a copy of the Aventuria Adventure Card Game Core Box to use this expansion. This expansion has an MSRP of $34.99 US. Now, the main purpose of this expansion is to expand the deck building options in Aventuria. Along with this, it also comes with extra dice, tournament rules, some rule clarifications, including an official FAQ, and variant builds for each of the four heroes included on the core game. Now, if you haven't checked out Adventuria and you're not sure what I'm talking about here and you're curious about the game, be sure to check out my Adventuria Adventure card game review for the lowdown on this cool fantasy card game that has really captured our interest. Now, jumping back to this expansion, if you want to take a look and uh, be sure to check out our Arsenal of Heroes unboxing video on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you can enjoy the sheer joy and shock as Mo discovers bits he wasn't expecting in the box. Yeah, this comes in a small box. It's got a nice plastic insert under a surprisingly thick 19-page booklet. Um, the insert holds a set of four 20-sided dice, five six-sided dice, and a sealed, rather thick deck of cards. And everything here is excellent. Card quality matches the original, which is what you hope for in a game like this, but no issues whatsoever. All right, what are we doing with these new cards and dice? How do you use Arsenal of Heroes to expand your Aventuria scheme? All right, so let's break it up into the different components and starting with the dice. So these are etched custom dice. They're color-coded and feature unique symbols on them uh, on the roll you want. So the ones on the D20s and the sixes on the D6s. Now, the D20s are meant to be used for your attack rolls and dodging during the game. They're color-coded based on the roll type. So you got a red die with a sword on it for melee attacks, a green die with a bow on it for ranged attacks, a purple die for magic attacks with the explosion, and a yellow die with boots for dodging. Yeah, this is all fun. I mean, as a dice collector, I can see the value, but unless you're playing this all the time, it's actually a little tricky. 
to have to think about what color attack or you're doing uh, or you know what color attack dodge is to make sure you're grabbing the right dice. Yeah, I guess. I, I don't know. They're neat. That, that's all I can say. They're, they're definitely not necessary. They're just neat to have. Um, the colors do match the colors on the card. So like your 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 sword, your melee attack has a sword and is red on your character. So there is some coordinating there. So it's not like guesswork or looking for a symbol. Now the D6s though, I have no clue. I honestly don't know exactly what the intended use for these are. Now during a game of Aventuria, at least based on the core box and the couple expansions I've opened, the only time you use D6s are for damage. That's the only thing I've ever used them for. I, I maybe no I can't even think of a chance where you roll it for a random result like on an even on an odd so I have to assume these are weapon damage dice now supporting that theory four of the dice feature icons of weapons that are in the game on the six side there's a flail a fireball a bow and a sword and they're also color-coded but that doesn't matter like the 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 the, the whatever the flail's orange whatever the fireball's red but then there's another die that's standard d6 but on the six it has an a it's the the Aventuria A, right? Like the the logo. That monster damage. I, again, a regular player will probably know which is their magic damage without even thinking. But I know I don't even feel close to the target market for these dice. Yeah. Now, now the stranger part is these are all just single D sixes, right? Like it would make more sense if a fireball did different damage than a flail. Although in some cases they do, right? Like the flail in particular, I recognize because my character has that, the dwarf I play. It does 3d6 damage, but there's only 1d6 with a flail on it. Like I, I, I don't quite know what they were going for here. Yeah, and I'm not sure because I haven't seen the multiple, uh, sorry, players use multiple d6 damage yet. Yeah. I've seen it come from, from villains, but as a player, my deck yet has never had me roll more than one. So, right. Yeah, the, the, the half elf rogue may only do single d6 damage. Whereas the dwarf, I have 2d6 weapons and a 3d6 weapon. Now it does cost nine endurance. It's big, which is why I want the die. Cause I'm like, I have my big flail. So I want the flail die. Cause I, I don't know. Anyway, dice, they're, they're neat. They're, yeah, they're kind of cool. People like next, dice. <laughs> next is the book. This starts off with a number of rule clarifications, including rules for discard piles. Cause it doesn't actually mention the book where to track those actually detailed timing rules, which people are going to recognize from other dueling card games, uh, clarifications on what fate points can be spent on. Uh, this is mainly due to a translation issue. I think we even mentioned in our full review where it just wasn't totally clear and it provides a nice chart that shows this is what you can use them for in dual mode and here's what you can use them for in the other mode. This is followed by a Q&A section with even more rule clarifications. The rule clarifications are actually half the book. Now, after that, you get the official tournament rules. Uh, these are provides three different formats and talks about making trees and all that fun stuff about running tournaments. Uh, the one part, excuse me, the one part I really liked was the spot on egg etiquette that says this. Please make an etiquette roll and use a fate point if necessary. Adventuria is a fast and action-packed game, so there might be the occasional heated moment. Yeah, this is the sort of thing that all games need to have when they get popular. But you don't always want to rush out at the start in that core set because mm -hmm. it could be a waste of resources developing a tournament system that is never going to catch on in your game. Now, the final section of the book in Arsenal Heroes provides a variant deck list for each of the four core heroes, along as some information on how they built the deck, why they built it that way, and strategy tips. All right, a nice little addition to help newer deck builders get ideas on how to customize. Now, finally, we get to the cards. This box set includes a complete set of the non-character specific, non-character unique cards from the core game. Now, it is noted on this box that you, with this box, can now build every possible deck combination from the core box. Now, in addition for this, the expansion also comes with two copies of five different promo cards. So if you do get a bit of new content as well as just repeats of the cards that are in the core set. Well, uh, so this is, uh, we got an idea of what you get and how it's used. The important question remains, is this worth picking up for Aventuria fans? I uh, have to take a moment just to say Apple <laughs> for one reason or another. We are getting distracted by our chat tonight. We do apologize. 
So Aventuria Arsenal Heroes is a rather useful box of expansion content for the Aventuria adventure card game. While marketed as an expansion for the dual mode of play, there's plenty in this box that'll be just as useful for groups playing cooperative adventures. I thought the component quality here was excellent. I appreciate the dice are actually etched and not printed, which means I don't have to worry about the, getting rubbed off after lots of play. And I actually like the box insert because all the other adventure stuff I've seen so far is just like pile everything in the empty box at the end. The nice thing I've actually realized about this box insert that I didn't mention above is that it can be a great way for transporting your Adventuria dual deck along with your dice. So you take that deck out and you put your 30 character dice in and your, your, your cards and everything else in. And I think this would be a great way to like, you know, bring your stuff to a friend's place or play at a local game store, or bring it to a tournament. No, it's not as fancy as like a nice card case or whatever, but it's very serviceable. I noticed that you've incorporated this insert into your bigger Aventuria box containment solution, yes. which... Well, for now, <laughs> for now, we'll, we'll see if it stays there. It is a way to keep the dice from rattling around. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's better than what came with the game. And, uh, getting back to the dice, I, yeah, there's no need for them, but I think they're neat. I, I didn't know they were in there, so I thought it was cool to see them. I'm like, that's neat. Um, we, we tried them. We used them. We tried to use them for the appropriate skills. Um, Ulysses Spiel, the yellow dodge die you sent us seems to be unbalanced because we haven't made a successful check with it yet. <laughs> now, my biggest issue um, with the dice, though, is this is a set for a single player. Like, yes, you could share the dice, but for games like this, like, I want to have my own set of dice. I don't want to share them with anyone else. And this is actually my main disappointment with this expansion overall, and something I noticed even when doing the unboxing video. This entire set is designed for one player, specifically interested in deck building and competitive play. Like it provides you with dice for one player. The ability for one player to use the cards in the box combined with the cards in the core set to make every possible combination of deck. Even the hero builds listed in the booklet are made for competitive dueling decks and not really for cooperative adventures. Now to really get the most out of this expansion, if you've got a game group at home that's playing Aventuria together, is you may want to pick up a copy of this for every player. Now, to be honest, it does say right on the box. It says dual expansion. So, yeah, that is what it's intended to be. The thing is, while duels are neat and all, what we really like playing is the Adventuria adventure mode, the cooperative adventure. It was really hoping this box would include enough cards for everyone to be able to customize their decks in a way they wanted, and... I don't want to incur the cost of picking up more copies of Arsenal Heroes to do this. Though I guess that's a way cheaper alternative than buying multiple core boxes. Yeah, no, it's an intriguing way to develop the system. And I wonder if the way the players in Germany do things differently than North American players, it could be that expectations between cultures have made this as distinct a product as it is in, in the, that strange way. Yeah, that's possible. I, I don't know enough about the German gaming industry or what's going on over there to know. Now, all that said, there is still plenty of the stuff in this box that a group mainly interested in cooperative play would be interested in. While there may not be enough cards for four players to customize their decks in every possible combination, there's still plenty of cards here, which means that each player can do some deck building without having to cannibalize and steal cards from other players' decks. Now, depending on how many players you have, you may not need to steal cards from other players' decks at all. Yeah, it, it will really come down to how many players and what sort of deck you're looking to build. If you're really looking to complement each other and develop a multi-pronged co-op strategy, it may not be a problem at all. Now, if you are interested in playing duels in Adventury especially, if you play, especially if you play to play competitively in tournament play, you're probably going to want to pick up Arsenal of Heroes, at least one copy. Not only will it give you access to every possible deck combination, you also get five new promo cards, two of each, and a cool set of dice and a way to transport your stuff. Now, for those just interested in adventure play, I think picking a copy of this box might be worth doing. In the base game, if you want to customize your heroes, you are forced to tear apart one of the other decks 
there and or make sure you swap and do like a math trade between all your decks so they all end up at 30. By having extra copies of the core cards, the need to do this is lessened. Now, if you only have one of you, yeah, you can do it with everything. But if you're only playing with two or three heroes, there's always that fourth hero's deck you can kind of tear apart. And along with that, again, you get a cool set of dice you can share or split among your group. While it's true to fully utilize this expansion, you would need a copy for every player, you probably don't need that if you're playing cooperatively. And if you do feel you want, want more than one copy, if you really all want to make the ultimate deck and use all the cards, I appreciate that it's much cheaper alternative to buying multiple core sets, which is something many of the other non-collectible card games expect you to do. Yeah, well, that's it for our review of Arsenal of Heroes for the Adventuria Adventure card game. I welcome you to also check out the more detailed written review of this expansion over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now that's Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. It's always a pretty dry week gaming-wise this past week, with things starting to open up a bit here. We had a number of different uh, appointments we had to hit this last week and other stuff going on, um, like getting one of my kids ready for high school. Now, as part of that, I'm happy to say that all of us, except my youngest, are now proud members of House Pfizer eagerly awaiting the time uh, my youngest can get her poke and the rest of us can line up for dose two yeah we're uh three out of four in this house with an assortment of houses uh spread <laughs> between us but just waiting on the birthday for the last one to get the first poke now regarding gaming we did play some adventuria on tabletop simulator uh with sean and i at first just a duel and then a short adventure um, we both then brought Deanna on board and played through the first two acts of the three-act adventure in the box. Now, while I think it's awesome that we have Tabletop Simulator as a resource, and the fact that we were even able to play with you is great, uh, playing this game on Tabletop Simulator is not ideal. Um, all three of us spent a lot of time fighting with the interface, especially in regards to flipping, stacking, sorting cards, which you do a lot in this game. Yeah, there are some interface aspects of Tabletop Simulator that I feel have been done better and more naturally elsewhere. Mm -hmm. However, if and when you take the time to mess around and play with it, it does get easier. And mm -hmm. if you can find all sorts of tricks for extra monitors and customizing, the problem is you need to go looking and Googling and playing. It's just not intuitive. Yeah, like one of the best features in, that, in Tabletop Simulator is to be able to set cameras but then we did something wrong and I shared my cameras with Sean and he lost his cameras. And there's just a lot of stuff going on there that just, uh, it, it, it can be frustrating. Yeah. Now, between last week and this week, I've spent a lot of time talking about Adventuria. And what I'd like to know is I've been talking about a lot. What have you been thinking? So I, I have to say, once you get past the struggles of Tabletop Simulator, yeah. the game is really fun. And I'm enjoying it much more than the Lord of the Rings or other similar, uh, you know, adventure card games I've experienced. Though I have to say, I haven't played Pathfinder for that comparison, which I think is probably more of an apples to apples yeah, it's uh, a than a closer. lot of them. It is definitely a little closer. Now, sticking with the topic of digital games, the other thing we did was we played a bunch of rounds of The Crew with one of our awesome Patreon Patreon backers. That came out a little weird. Patreon Patreon backers. Now, this is something you could do too, right? If you support us at the seat at the table level, you too can game with the Bellhop team, all three of us, two of us, or whatever. So this time we sat down with one of our patrons, Evil John, and we had a great time playing through, I think we finished five missions of the crew, which got us up to number 30, which leaves us only 20 left to get to the end of the core missions. If I remember correctly, 28, killed us like we it took us more than 10 tries to get through 28 and just since we started like i get that the first couple are going to be easy but like every time we sit down to do this now i feel like we're getting steeper up the ramp though i gotta say I, we're all digging it like this is such a good game yeah no absolutely i'm noticing that certain levels are really at the mercy of the deal for missions that that mm -hmm. comes up I won't necessarily say some are impossible, but your odds in certain configurations are just less than ideal. See, I don't know. I, I honestly, I'm starting, like, you were the one originally that said, 
you think that there's some impossible to win if you get the wrong draw missions. And I, I'm, I'm leaning towards you, especially that one round again, playing 28 where I had all four rockets. I'm like, I don't think there was any way we could, I think we could have played that open cards and we still couldn't have succeeded on that. Possibly. All right. Now the so luckily again, though, if you lose quickly, you can just re restart easily and, and give it another go. And that is the biggest advantage of board game arena with that game. Cause one of the things I don't like about playing the physical game is the amount of setup, the, the shuffling of all the decks and putting the counters out and then passing them around. And you got the little cards you got to put in front of you and the big cards that you go in your hand. So that is something board game arena definitely gets a bonus on. Now the final game I got to the table is a Kickstarter preview prototype copy of battle of gog this is was sent to me from vitali uh who is as far as i know the owner but or at least works for crazy box inc uh this was sent over for us to take a look at so this is a preview again not a review um this is an old testament biblically themed war game that features a very ingenious map making element and familiar gameplay elements combined in what i think is an interesting way now, the map building actually uses the box, which is specifically designed so that when you flip it over, the bottom is inset a bit, so you get a lip around the outside. Now, over the typical back of the box art and information and why you should buy this game is a light grid that you can see. And at the start of the game, you're going to shuffle up a bunch of map tiles and draw them and place them on the map with some specific rules for them. Now, these tiles, to me, look like Sid Meier's Civ II, like going back to the Amiga days. They're, they're featuring square gridded terrain of different types, excuse me, square gridded terrain of different types with different resources on some of the spots. So while interesting and unique with the, with the box mechanic, is it useful or helpful to uh, um, use this as opposed to using something like non-stick shelf liner right on your table? All right, so the thing you're missing is the fact there's a grid there and you can put a tile anywhere. I can't do that on my non-stick mat. When I've got a, a huge grid and I put one out kind of in the middle and then I want to put another one four away, there's no way I could do that. Now they could produce a play mat, but a play mat would probably be slippery. So it actually does work really well. So I, I had the same thought you did as I was like, why don't we just grab one of my non-stick mats? But like, unlike Catan or one of those games where you're building off one spot and continuing to build, this is, I've got the whole grid. I, off the top of my head, I don't know how many across by how many it is, but it's not small. Okay. And you can put it anywhere. So because of that, you need that grid that's on the back of the box. And then once everything's placed, I will say it's not tight. Like you, I, I expected it to like just fit and not slide at all. It, there is a little bit of movement, but like enough that you're not going to spill it unless you flip the lid. Okay. Now, once the map's built, you start off with three soldiers on the map. These are represented by those little micro dice. People like to use them for battle tech. They're little tiny D6s. The pip on the dice represents the level of the unit. Now, early in the game, you're going to start with three on the board, and you're going to use them to explore out into the map. Well, not really explore. It's all uh, it's all there. There's no exploration. They're, you're going to spread out on the map and found cities. Now, cities are represented by larger D6s. And in this case, I think they did a smart move here by using the RPG-style dice that have numbers instead of pips. So it's easy to tell the two different types of dice apart. Now, once you found your first city, every round going forward, you're going to start generating resources. Now, resources are generated based on the map features around your cities. And it's one of those things, again, it, it reminds me of Civ, because if you have a level one city, you only get the squares right adjacent, where if you're level two or higher, you get further out. And there are three different types of resources to collect. You've got wood, food, and gold. Now, you're going to spend these to do stuff, like hire more soldiers, upgrade the level of your soldiers, upgrade your cities, and et cetera. So I haven't had my hands on this product myself as, as the uh, pandemic keeps us apart. Mm -hmm. As I listen to this with all these dice on tiles on a box, have you run into any troubles nudging or bumping the box and, and causing uh, displacement of things? It hasn't happened yet, but I would not want to small play on a small table. Like with my big game table, right. it's far enough in the middle. You're not going to bump it. And if you bump that table, nothing moves. It's a big, heavy table. It's a big board game table. I wouldn't want to say put this on a second cup table, even though the box might fit just with that little wobbliness, because yes, if your dice get moved around, there isn't it. The tiles, again, aren't going anywhere. They're, right. they're well designed. But once you start putting little dice on these squares, yeah. there is a chance. Now, one of the things that got me to review this, I had watched a previous review of it, or preview, sorry, it's again, it's not out yet, is, is the way the combat works. This features mostly deterministic combat. To attack, you just move one of your soldiers that's got more pips 
than the opponent on top of their their die. And then you remove their die from the board and reduce your soldier by the number of levels equal to the level of the opponent. So if you move your five onto a three, you remove the three and set your five to a two. Really simple. I love that. Like, that's brilliant, in my opinion. Like, such a simple system. Now, sieging cities is harder. You need three soldiers. And they have to be as tough as the city. So taking out cities is difficult. But if you do manage to take out a city, instead of going down, you are in a scroll and your troops actually go up one level. It seems straightforward and very small worldish, though I do wonder how your troops get better after engaging in a siege. But hey, so, you know, I actually think this has historic precedent because we're going back to ancient battles. And traditionally, when you would capture a city, you would recruit most of that army into yours. So I think enough. it represents you amalgamating the conquered city's troops into your own. All right, then. Now, you win the game by either eliminating all of another player's cities. No, it's not every other player's city. So if you're playing with more than two, you just have to eliminate one player's cities. Collecting five scrolls or controlling the four corners of the map by having a soldier in each of the four corners. Now, along with all this, there are rules for finding treasure, uh, learning abilities, moving Gog, who is a little miniature on the map, and the Angel of Retribution along the board. This is all stuff I'll cover once we do a full detailed review that I'm not going to get into now. Overall... This game feels like a mashup of three things. It feels like civilization because of the way the maps and the cities work. That whole top-down view of your map and you see a, a, a fish in the water and you see a turkey over there means you generate two food. That just feels so much like Civ to me. And it feels like a tan because you get all your resources at the start of the turn and you have this pile of resources and then you generally, until you learn it, look at this card that shows what you can spend them on. And you spend your resources to do things. Like it really feels like spending two wood to build or two two brick to build a road kind of thing. It's I spend two food to put a new troop out. I spend two wood to improve their equipment. I spend two of each resource to found a new city and so on. And then you mentioned it, small world. That deterministic combat of I count how many are in my stack, reduce how many are in that stack, and move. It's almost identical without the push or luck, because a small world has a thing where if you're not equal, you can roll a die. That's gone. Now, there is dice rolling here. If you attack someone of the same level, you actually roll dice instead of it being deterministic. Now, again, this is a prototype. It is very much a prototype that is still in the middle of being developed. This is not a finished game. Not only will the components and artwork possibly change by the time the game's finished, many of the rules are still in flux to the point that the designer wrote me again today with a rule fix. So the big thing that seems to be fluctuating are the resource costs to do things, especially with the scrolls. Now, the reason I really want to talk about this tonight is this game is going to hit Kickstarter on June the 8th, and I hope I'll be back with a detailed review next week to give you more information on it, but it will go live before our show goes live. So just in case people do want to check it out, or if that sounds really interesting. Fair enough. Well, I'm dabbling with something digital that we are going to be talking about in more detail in future episodes. And as of right now, it is seven minutes past midnight on June 3rd. So I'm actually able to announce that we are previewing uh, Blood Bowl 3, the video game, uh, and, uh, and doing some beta testing on that. So uh, we will have more to say about that. Uh, it's only just opened up to yeah. us even. So... We will get more to that. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? I I don't know. I like I remember last week. I'm like I'm gonna play Aventuria and try out Forest and get to Forest No Return, and we're gonna finish Magic Kitties, and then I'm also gonna play Aroma, and I'm gonna get back to Unfair and play Guild. I, none of that happened. Absolutely zip zilch nada. All I did was digital gaming. Um, even though Deanna was pushing to play Aventuria, it just didn't happen. There was too much going on. Uh, what I did do is I did the research. Unfortunately, we cannot play Aroma. So I apologize, Essential Oils, whoever puts that out. We need the pandemic to end. I, I will get to it as soon as I can. I did not realize it is not kid safe. And it is something that honestly, like, it would be dangerous to play with my kids if they happen to ingest the oils. Due to that, it's stuck with just two players. And ever, there are four ways to play the game. None of them work with only two players. So that one's going on the back burner. So we're tossing that one away. Um, what I want to dig into is Forest of Heroes for Aventuria. At some point, we should sit down and finish the third act of the one we were playing with Dieta. And um, we did figure out we could play Unfair on Tabletop Simulator. So we're going to try to fit that in. Sunday, um, coming up this weekend, I am going to run a game for two of our Patreon patrons. 
again, back at the right level, and you could be part of this too. And I'm going to teach him Aventuria. We're going to use tabletop simulators. We're probably going to have to fight with it. Um, Sean's going to join me, and we are going to teach two of our patrons how to play Aventuria on tabletop simulators. So that one's going to happen. That's Sunday night. I don't think we're going to live stream it just because then we don't have to worry about language and trying to make sure we don't say anything inappropriate or any of that. Not that we're like, ter- well, actually, Dana might be in the room. We're not usually terrible potty mouths or anything. Uh, other than that, who knows? Honestly, like at, at this point, it's still quarantine here in Ontario. Uh, a whole bunch of changes came into place today because the stay at home order went away, which meant absolutely nothing. I, who knows? Yep. <laughs> Next week, probably not a lot's going to change. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon patrons. We greatly appreciate their support. Kator, Kat and Tori, happy birthday, Kat. Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, I know you're already in bed, but thanks, Danielle. Ah, she was very active in chat tonight and dug the, the, the entire interaction, so that was cool. Uh, Sean P. Kelly of the excellent Gaming and BS podcast for our RPG fans. You're going to want to check this one out. You can watch Brett and Sean record live here on Twitch. Usually, not this week, Monday nights. Tonight, they're competing with us. So don't watch them tonight. Watch us tonight. Well, I I think they're far enough before us. They're in Central. I think they would have been done before we went live. They they started just before we did. Oh, did they? Oh, well. That's fine. We love them anyway. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always catch us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatchers of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. The other thing you'll find a link to is this awesome place called Patreon where if you go there, you can tip your bellhops, which is something we greatly appreciate, which gets you all kinds of cool stuff, like access to our Discord, bonus audio, behind-the-scenes blog posts, and the chance to sit down and play games with us. Again, patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the Pando Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game game on. on.